Uh, let's go. All right, so we're recording. So this is uh, Gilson being in some philosophers chapter one on being in the one, right? Um, uh, Jim, I now hear a little bit of background from you. Me, How's me, that? I'm hearing me over your mic, in other words. Is that better? Try again, try again. You still got Hi. a little bit of echo. So I have a little bit of echo, how about now? You, you're, you're not echoing, I'm echoing on yours. Say that again? When I speak, there's, with a yeah. slight delay, I'm hearing back through your mic. Well, let me do this then. I'm gonna fix that. By reorganizing here. We are back to recording and uh, Echo, echo dealt with. Um, echo. Echo, echo. So, so uh, um, your first remark was that it was riveting, and uh, Joe's first remark was that it was obscure, especially once you got past Plato and into Plotinus. Um, oh. So uh, I think part of that is um, uh, background. It's the uh, how familiar people are with the different pieces of these things. Um, uh, but I, I definitely am interested in uh, in sort of um, first impressions of all this. Um, uh, there's multiple things we want to talk about. We want to talk about the little intro section. We want to talk a little bit about Gilson himself and uh, the fact that he's not a Platonist, but he's trying to explain Platonism to you. Um, hmm. Then we want to talk about uh, the Plato part itself. Sorry, not even the Plato start itself, the Parmenides part itself and the Plato start itself, right? And to what degree Plato is just Parmenides redux and to what degree he's going beyond him. Um, and then <laughs> and then, as, uh, then as we get to the the Neoplatonists. We get to all of the stuff that comes after Plato in the sense of uh, Plotinus, Proclus, uh, the medievals, all the way ahead to Meister Eckhart, right? So um, uh, there's a whole uh, tradition there. And, and it's that last part, especially, where all the issues with Gilson himself will come out. Because um, Gilson is uh, a Thomist, uh, a disciple of Aquinas, in other words, and uh, not a Platonist, the closest he gets to understanding Platonism is his affinity for uh, Augustine. Um, but he's going to read Augustine in a particular way to try and make him less Platonist and more um, acceptable to his Gilson's Aquinian understanding of things. Um, so uh, there'll be parts of that second half of the chapter where Gilson is determinately trying to read Neoplatonism out of the history of Christian philosophy, so to speak, um, and pretend that it's something alien. He has a massive problem trying to do this, which he's not really, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is um, uh, everything he's trying to say there is something which um, only makes sense in the Latin West. It doesn't make sense at all in the Orthodox East, the Greek Orthodox East, uh, where the uh, Christian theologies were Neoplatonist from the get-go. Um, mm -hmm. And when people like uh, John Scotus, um, uh, Eurogena, uh, are talking about Neoplatonism in the West, they're doing so because they're reading the Greek uh, fathers. Um, uh, they're reading the, the Greek Orthodox, right? Um, and Gilson is kind of insensitive to this because he doesn't know the Greek Orthodox fathers nearly as well as he knows the Latin West ones. Okay, so that's just a, a point about Gilson himself, which we'll which we'll get to. Um, but I had one uh, quick question, sure. sort of ticky tacky, but is it Gilson or is it Gilson? Because I think I, it's Gilson. I tried to read up. I read up on him, and I think he's French. And a, a couple French. lectures I saw, they, they called him Gilson. 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 Yeah. Gilson. I just call him Gilson. Uh, okay. I also call him Etienne. I don't call him e Etienne, <laughs> or or Etienne. <laughs> we call him. Or I call him I, so I'm, I'm probably I should probably be calling him Etienne Gilson, but I call him Etienne Gil Gilson. <laughs> it's my, my, call my, him Steve my, Gilson. My my, my franglais, right? Um, yeah, fair fair question. Uh, and if you think he's hard to pronounce, uh, wait till you get to the actual philosophers in the Middle Ages. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I wanted to point point that out because there's uh, by the time we're in chapter two, and certainly by the time we're in the later chapters. Gilson is going to be a relatively sympathetic witness to all the different people he's talking about, but you got to know going in that he's got a lance to break against Neoplatonism um, because he uh, is part of a 
um, Thomas thing inside uh, Christian theology that wants to see the things which were before Aquinas as being um, less orthodox than maybe they were at the time. I'm going to put it that way. Um, and orthodox, maybe not the right word there. But uh, the, the, the massive problem that he has is that uh, um, uh, Neoplatonism antedates Aquinas by, by a millennia. Right. So he, here, here he is in, you know, a, a millennia after Aquinas tell, trying to tell us that Aquinas, a millennia after Oregon, um, is the uh, is, is the correct way of understanding uh, uh, Christ, Christian theology or something like it. And that the way of understanding Christian theology that, that pretty much all the Christians had for the first 400 years of Christianity um, uh, can be excluded based upon uh, a, a couple of arguments, which he, uh, Gilson, will, will, will deploy, uh, some of which he got from uh, Aquinas and some of which he didn't. Um, and we'll have to examine how well those arguments work in the second half of the chapter. But anyway, all that's just, you know, anticipating the most controversial things we're headed for in the sense of the places where you have to read Gilson skeptically. I think I mentioned before, before you started all this that Gilson is not a, well, you have to read all philosophers skeptically, but uh, he, he's, he's uh, someone with, an, with, a, with a position uh, that you have to be aware of. He's going to be a reasonably good guy to a lot of these people, but he definitely has a dog in this fight, so to speak. And the particular fight he has the dog in is not primarily the philosophic fight. He has a dog in that one too, but he's more more front about. But the theological fight, he also has a dog in. Um, anyway, um, okay, all that's just by way of preface, right? The the the, the fundamental thing we have is um, he start he's starting off with the notion of what metaphysics is that he gets from Aristotle, which we had already seen when we were doing, a, when we were doing Heidegger, right? The investigation of being qua being, right? Um, and he says that uh, it has to be what is not, um, it has to be about something which is not just a piece of being. You don't want to just cut off quantity and get mathematics or cut, cut off life and get biology, right? You want to take um, being qua being has to be uh, wide enough to embrace uh, all of the different things which are, so to speak. Um, and he claims that that's a, uh, an admonition from Aristotle that um, metaphysics has to obey or it will wind up contradicting itself and falling apart. I wanna just point out that for some of the uh, moderns that we've been reading that were going off in a very uh, subjectivist direction, it may be, uh, you can see that in some ways they fall into the sphere of this criticism, right? They're the people that think that if you can explain mind, you can explain everything, right? Um, without having first determined whether or not mind is everything, something like that. Um, so uh, if uh, if uh, Nietzsche says the whole viewed from inside, we will power nothing else. The first question is, is the whole viewed from inside the whole? Um, or is it just a piece that you've cut off that can look like it has will or spirit at the bottom of it? Um, but only because you cut off only a piece and didn't get the whole thing. Anyway, that's just uh, thoughts I had on 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 that uh, that that preface. He also mentions the uh, the paradox of all this, um, and this is kind of a paradox in Heidegger too. Heidegger is always telling us that other people have forgotten the question of being, um, by which he mostly means they didn't think about it the way I did. Um, <laughs> and this is kind of our this book is kind of our evidence that. They had very much not forgotten about the question of being. They were just thinking about it in a very different way. Um, but uh, Gilson says um, it's paradoxical that we say that all these philosophers didn't understand being. We also say that it is the first and simplest principle from which all uh, <laughs> thought begins, right? Um, or as, as he puts it, um, how can being both be constantly present to the most common mind yet prove so elusive that so many very great philosophers have failed to see it? Um, so the degree to which they have failed to see it will remain a, uh, a charge rather than something he has yet proven, but he'll try to prove it. Um, uh, so his, his reaction to that is, is maybe the problem is just hard, right? Maybe it's not that they're so dense, but maybe the problem is actually harder than we think. Okay. So, uh, uh, the first thing he tries to start with before he even gets into Plato is he tries to talk about what he, he, he makes this reference, passing reference to Kant and the meaning of the words. And 
um, the particular thing he's trying to read out of Kant is what he calls um, the existential neutrality of conceptual knowledge. Um, and I wanted to just dwell on this concept for a second and ask about it um, to, to ask if it was clear. Is it clear what he meant by existential neutrality of conceptual knowledge in Kant? I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> James, you're on, you're, Jim, you're on mute. Like everything in this, you know, I have my thoughts, but they're oh. more like I'm waiting for them to be developed. Sure. I just thought he was just trying to set us up for how we know the difference between, or trying to set up so we understand the difference between existence and being. And I thought that that, uh, he said that so that later we could make sense of how the other thinkers um, were trying to show that existence and being might be separate. Then that's what I thought he did it for. Maybe, I, and I guess so. I was so wrong you're, about part, that. you're part. You're partly right. Uh, partly, uh, Gilson is showing some of his own cards here in that um, he's going to think that uh, much of the kind of um, essential notion of being the notion of being as essence that he finds in the in Plato and the Platonists is a result of um, uh, a projection of the characteristics of conceptual thinking into being itself, something like that. So he, he, he's making this point first yeah. about conceptual knowledge. Conceptual knowledge is not yet being, and the relationship between them is one which is still obscure. But starting from the position of a modern, you know, uh, semi-skeptical or critical epistemologist like Kant, right? He's going to say, um, conceptual knowledge is existentially neutral. So what does he mean by that? He means that, uh, he means that all of your theorems about the relationship between one essence and another essence don't care whether or not those things actually exist, right? Um, he, he gives the example of the, 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 the hundred possible dollars and the hundred actual dollars, right? The hundred actual uh, possible dollars yeah, have yeah. exactly as many cents in them as the hundred actual dollars. The only problem is that you can't buy a loaf of bread with them, right? Um, but the, there's no conceptual difference between the the possible thing and the actual thing, right? And that's what he means by the existential neutrality of conceptual knowledge. The, the, the concept itself doesn't change whether there is any instance of it or not. The relations among the possible things and among the actual things appear to be entirely the same from the point of view of our concepts. And uh, he, he makes the claim, if you add something to a given concept, you don't get uh, a more actual concept or something, you get a different concept, right? If you add something to your 100 possible dollars, you get something other than 100 possible dollars. You get 100 possible dollars in, in Timbuktu or something, but you don't get 100 actual dollars. Right? You can put various additional modifications on it, but all those additional modifications are possible additions to a concept, whether that concept is possible or actual. And another way of putting this is that the, the notion of actuality or actualization appears to be independent of how we conceptually think about things. Now, one way of putting this is just to say our conceptual knowledge is abstract. right? It's not concrete. This is the way Hegel would put it, right? Uh, something is, is abstract. If it's uh, the same in the realm of the possibles or the actuals, it's just a matter of concepts. It's a matter of abstractions from things. Um, and uh, all those things are distinguished from things to the moderns um, precisely by this actuality relation, which we'll get to later. But um, the, the, the the point he's trying to draft out of Kant is the idea that our concepts themselves don't care in the thing that we're reasoning about, whether or not the thing exists or not. So think about it if you're doing physics, you're doing mathematical physics, right? All the math is the same, whether you have, whether there is any structure that meets the statics diagram or not, right? And you reason about what would happen in every case in which these statics, these forces were set up and you come to the answer often in, in the realm of mathematical abstraction, and that answer will apply whenever the conditions of the, of the test that you set up applied. And that's how you use it as a map for things which would actually occur. If you want to know whether or not those conditions actually apply in the real world, you have to go out and use your senses to ascertain the state of the real world and hit things with hammers and whatever else. You have to 
leave the world of mathematical physics and the world of mathematics and the world of reasoning and enter the world of observation and sense in order to get to the actual um, the actual instances of things that your conceptual maps were designed to navigate. But the conceptual maps don't care about that at all. The, the, the conceptual math of your physics problem, of your statics problem in physics, right, are exactly the same, whether you're doing it abstractly on a blackboard, whether you're treating it as a piece of mere math, or whether or not you're solving those statics for whether or not a, a given bridge actually stays up. Now, if there's some slip between your idealizations about the bridge and the actual material facts about the bridge, if you're, you know, made some idealization about how strong its supports were or something which turned out to be wrong, obviously these two things can, can slip between one another, right? But in principle, if you have the right uh, conceptual things about the particular instance, it's going to be a useful guide to it. And that's why science works, right? You can reason about the abstract logical thing and get the right answer about the actual things, right? So all of our conceptual knowledge works in this abstract, just the logical concept way. We do all of our reasoning in just the logical concept way. And then we trust that we're going to be able to navigate an actual reality with it by just making sure that the two things map onto each other or the two formal things line up, right? But the, the, the abstractions we use, the concepts we use, the math we use to model things is completely indifferent to whether or not those things actually exist at all, right? It doesn't care. Um, it's reasoning about logical abstractions, about pure concepts. Yep. And because Gilson is fundamentally Aristotelian and realist, he thinks that that's the same as saying all of our logic and concepts are purely abstract. And he thinks that the material particulars out there that you can hit with a hammer are the real things. And the math is abstractions that are useful for navigating them, but that's all. He wants reality being an actuality to coincide with the stuff, not that mathematical physics are about, but that experimental physicists are about as opposed to the theoretical physicists, right? He wants being to be the things the experimentalist sees, not the things that the theoretical physicist works with. He wants being to be what you can hit with a hammer. Something like that. Uh, he, he's, he's, he's going to relax that in a few places because he needs a place for uh, things to at least subsist that are, you know, relations among things that are more abstract than that. Um, but uh, his, his tendency is all toward the empirical and realist side, right? And his inclination, whenever he sees something which is an essential or thought-like or math-like, is to regard it as a perhaps useful abstraction, but that isn't entirely real. And this is one of the other things that you see going on in Gilson is that he keeps using the word reality for the stuff which he wants to count as true, actually being, and the stuff that the scholastics, the medieval scholastics would not call reality, but would call actuality, right? Actuality is what happens in yeah. act, what, what transpires in time, right? And reality to the medievals is instead what is independent of the opinions of any particular mind. So all the truths of mathematics are real to the, in, the, in the sense of reality that the, that the medieval scholastics use. They're not actual. Two plus two equals four is not something which is actual. It didn't come into being at 642 on, you know, uh, 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 on a certain December afternoon, right? Uh, there's no time affecting it, but it's real. So the, the, the scholastic distinction, real and actual, was exactly about this, is it affected by the category of time thing? But Gilson is inclined to keep using the word real for things which other people would call actual, because he's enough of a realist, if you pardon the expression, that he, uh, he wants the actual beings that are in time, that are, have instances that occur to count as the real things. And he wants the, the, the things which are just thoughts about them to be uh, only real as thoughts, and the contents of the thoughts are abstract. OK. So that's a bit of background on just Gilson's own bias and why he's bringing up the Kant part. Um, yeah. So I had a quick question. Go. Uh, for distinction. Uh, go, go. Um, does he, how does he feel about, all I kept thinking about when you were saying that and when we read this was potentiality to actuality from Aquinas's um, first mover thing. And uh, I was wondering if he thinks like that, 
So well, why does he? So so uh, so potentiality and play in? potentiality and actuality are very much going to be on point here, right? And and the the uh, the the only possible and the purely potential, as opposed to the actual in the sense of being in act and affected by the category of time, are very much going to be what this is all about. And th and that's already there in Aristotle. Aristotle is the philosopher of uh, of possible versus actual and and of uh, energeia activity as the as the basic thing of real things transpiring in time um, and Aquinas himself is also going to make much about that some of the later people in this classic tradition are going to have are going to instead insist that everything that Aquinas or Gilson would be calling existence they just want to cover with the concept actuality right so uh, uh, existence and actuality are going to be very much the problematic all along the way. And actuality can be thought of as having two contraries. One contrary of the actual is the possible, and the other con contrary of the actual is the real. The possible is a potential or possible actual that isn't yet actual. The real doesn't need to be potentially possible in that actualization in time sense, it could just be outside of time, like a truth of mathematics, right? So a truth of mathematics is not adequately described as being possible, right? Okay, but all of that is on the uh, Aristotelian actualization side of things. And we're starting instead with the Platonic side of things. And the Platonic side of things can best be understood by uh, thinking of them as being in the uh, lineage of Parmenidean rationalism and of um, Pythagorean uh, mathematism, the Platonists are the people who think that math is real. They think that their mathematical concept guide to the world is the world. They think that all of the actualization stuff you're talking about are just the manifestations of the actual machinery behind the world, which is thought-like and mathematical. Right. So the Platonists are people who thinks that things are made out of thought like or math like uh, stuff. And they do not see something being conceptual as saying that it's not real. Right. The Aristotelian can hit things with a hammer. People right, are going to say to the extent something is, is concept like to that degree, it is less than real. And the, and the Platonists are going to say to the extent that something is not concept like it's uh, it's probably an illusion. And the concept like is the real, right? That's gonna be the fundamental difference between the Platonists and the non-Platonists, or especially the Aristotelian. Not Aristotelian, Aristotle himself is kind of in the middle, but some of the later Aristotelians are later empiricists, right? Um, but the, the there's a whole Greek tradition before Plato and including Plato that wants to think of the the conceptual and the mathematical as being more real than the empirical is, right? Um, and this this is this gives some people uh, trouble, especially people with a look like an empiricist background. Uh, there's a uh, uh, Gilson is, is sensitive to this. He, he he mentions the fact that doctors tend to be Aristotelians and uh, and mathematicians tend to be Platonists, right? Um, uh, because someone who's dealing with, deal, dealing with a, a messy, barely understood empirical reality that is recalcitrant to his reason uh, tends to believe in the, uh, in the existence of material matter that is far beyond what his concepts can grasp or capture, whereas the mathematician tends to believe that the stuff which he can perfectly understand mathematically is real and that the only reason that the, phys that the uh, physician doesn't see things that way is because he doesn't have a sufficiently accurate mathematical map of the complex body he's trying to treat. Right. Um, Makes sense to me that I usually operate with that premise. And, and uh, I know a, a very giant part of economics says too. Yes, yes. I mean, this, this is a, uh, a distinction that cuts through later uh, disciplines, certainly. Um, and there's a tendency in the modern world to see there is only as much actual knowledge in any given discipline as there is math in it. Right. That's following methods of Galileo and Descartes, who are both mathematicians in this respect and are both Platonizers in this respect. 
and both of them were self-consciously you know, reacting against or revolting against a too Aristotelian previous understanding of science from their point of view. They were not trying to be more empiricist than the, than the Aristotelians before them. They were trying to be more mathematical than the uh, Aristotelians before them. Um, and thus the famous, you know, when, they, when they're trying to decide whether or not Copernicus is right, uh, they don't want it to come down to a test of observation. They want it to come down to a test of mathematical elegance, right? The, the, the simpler mathematically elegant explanation is the sign that that's the way it actually works. Um, anyway, that, so that's just other intimations of this Plato Aristotle kind of gap that you see elsewhere. Um, but in, in all that, Gilson understand is very much on the Aristotelian end of that spectrum. He's not on the Plato end of that spectrum. Um, okay. Uh, Okay, uh, so we talked about the natural inclination of a, of a philosopher who uh, starts with a, um, uh, an existentially neutral concept of being, and he basically is saying that uh, um, what we see in Parmenides, this is Gilson's own thesis, what we see in Parmenides is someone who takes seriously the idea that our conceptual knowledge is an adequate guide to reality, and so the things which we find true about our abstract concepts will be true of actual re well, of, of, of reality, not sorry, of actual reality, but of, of reality. And the end result is he arrives at a very um, paradoxical monism. What do I mean by that? Paradoxical because it denies a lot of the experiences of the senses, and monism because it issues in the uh, uh, Parmenidean injunction, being is. <laughs> um, being is and almost only being is. Okay, so we're, we're headed towards Plato and through Plato to Neoplatonism, but before we get there, Parmenides mm -hmm. is like the big, the first big guy we come across, right? And after his throat clearing uh, preliminaries where he sort of laid the groundwork and has also set up his skeptical objection that all this stuff that the Platonists are gonna be talking about is to me, Gilson, just conceptual knowledge and therefore contained in the mental as such, right? It's not the whole map of the world. It's just something that he, Gilson, thinks of as being about um, uh, abstract mindliness or something like that. Um, uh, all of that issues in Parmenides. And he, he, he presents Parmenides, I think, fairly as it, an, an evolution from the previous um, nature thinkers of the Greeks, right? The nature thinkers of the Greeks were saying things like all is water or all is air, right? Or all is hot and cold. And uh, in that whole um, uh, stew, you get someone who um, says the uh, all is undetermined right before Parmenides. And then you get Parmenides who says all is being. Um, and he thinks that the all is being is the, the unshakable answer to the question. It's the answer to the answer to the question, which is certain, uh, because to him it is, we would later say, tautological, right? It's it's uh, a fact included in the concept, so to speak. And and does this is, concept sort of include that idea of, of it always, you know, um, not so much being permanent, but always being renewing to the identical, like we so, also saw Nietzsche. Uh, uh, there is a little bit of that, but it's it's not as a premise, but as as a deduction, right? Right. He wants right. right. uh, Parmenides right. wants to uh, uh, deduce the unchanging the unchanging character of what truly is in the full sense of being from the fact that uh, for true being change is impossible, right? Oh. So um, one way to think about that is the. The, the statement that being is, is a truth outside of time that nothing that ever happens in time can change. Right? That's one way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is a, this is a, uh, something we, we would be inclined to view as a, a tautology of logic or something like that. But uh, to Parmenides, it's way more than that. It's the the, the first bedrock rational certainty that the human mind can discover and build upon. And 
it is so bedrock certain that it is way more certain than anything empirical or any uh, idea that my hypotheses are useful because they comport to the facts or anything like that. He's a, he's a conceptual first principles thinker. He's not trying to just create a map of a use to navigate the, the, uh, an empirical world. He's trying to understand the world from first principles logically, so to speak. Um, and the first logical fact is being is, and this fact is, um, insensitive. Okay. Is he speaking as a subject? I mean, like the I object idea, because I'm thinking about if, if it were the does does sign. No, it's not. I know it's not, but yeah, would it be but... the same thing as that, uh, such a, such a whatever waking up and saying, oh, being right. around me. He's not, he's, he, uh, there is, there is as yet no consciousness in this first notion that being is. Parmenides' second most famous saying is that being and thinking are the same, is the way it's usually translated. Mm -hmm. The actual uh, translation of this often misses the um, math-like essential note in it, which has as much accent on the last syllable as on the other two. And most of the people read it as uh, being and thinking are the same is set telling me something about being and thinking, or especially telling me something about thinking. But to Parmenides, it's at least as much telling you something about this concept, same. Um, the, uh, uh, right, so uh, some of them translate it even, even worse. They'll say, uh, to be and to be thinkable, or to be and thought, or something like that. This is not what he's saying. It's being and thinking, two different um, verbs made into nouns, right? And the statement about them is that each of them, as well as to each other, are being the same. So there is a, there is a being statement being made about the being of being and same and about the uh, being of thought and same. And it's something like, for something to be is the same as it to have sameness. For something to be thought is the same as saying uh, there is a sameness. There is a sameness required between the thought and the thing, th and the thing thought. There's a sameness required between the thing which is and uh, the, the thing's own concept, also the thing's own future, something like that. So sameness first applies both within being itself and within the structure of thinking, where by thinking we mean thinking and the thing thought. Both of them require this sameness relation. And thinking that is worthy of the name is also in that sameness relation to being. Thinking is thinking being, or it's not thinking. It's thinking the same as being, or it's not thinking. Correct thinking is thinking what is. If you're thinking what is not, you're not thinking. You're confused. So being and thinking are the same is trying to say that thinking acquires its true status as thinking by a sameness relation between it and being. This is a little bit like our later correspondence theory of truth, right? Without necessarily any picture like aspect to it. But if you're thinking the way being actually is, you're thinking. And the claim is that uh, we would say homeomorphism between thinking and being, right? Is both how thinking works and functions as a guide to being. And it's also uh, why there is no gap between our conceptual machinery and what is. It's a, this is a claim that accurate thought and, and, the, and the, the, the actual truth of what is are equivalent. Now, Gilson would react, oh no, but because actual thought is, is, is just thought and it's just an abstraction. But that's exactly because he's denying this proposition of Parmenides. He's denying that being and thinking are the same. He's saying being is always something wonderful, great and majestic, independent of thinking, and is always more than thinking. 
thinking never even begins to measure up to being. That's the kind of thing that Gilson would try to say. But that's not what Parmenides is saying. Parmenides is saying accurate thinking, thinking worthy of the name, comports to, conforms to, is one to one and on to with what actually is, what is what is real with being. And that is because sameness characterizes being itself through time and the relationship between thought and being. And that's how thinking and being are the same. Mm. Okay, so this is one of the most famous uh, uh, statements in Greek metaphysics. Um, and Gilson glosses it as, so Parmenides is saying that to be is to be thinkable or to be intelligible. And that's correct. If being and thinking are the same, then there is nothing which is, which is not also thought, at least in the, at least in the possible sense. There might be something which isn't, isn't thought now or isn't thought yet, but there's nothing which is not thought-like or thinkable. So <clears throat> this, this equation of Parmenides enforces as a, as a, as a corollary that everything which is, is intelligible. Okay. How does that um, work with, um, uh, he was trying to make, say that uh, like a rock as being or an object as being. Remember he was making that, trying to, trying to explain it. How does that work with his concept of being as opposed to Parmenides or did he just use that just to make it easy for us to understand? I think he made it harder for us to understand because uh, Parmenides does not think a rock has being. Right. Right. Um, Aristotle yeah. thinks the rock has being, and uh, and and uh, um, uh, uh, realists like uh, Gilson think that the rock has being, especially when they're Aristotelian. But Plato doesn't. Not Plato doesn't. Uh, Parmenides doesn't. Um, so, uh, what does Parmenides think has being? Uh, being primarily <laughs> we'll, we'll get to uh, yeah, how much it's... how much can be extended from that but the the uh the the place where gilson is at his best right is here where he says um at first light it looks quite natural to consider that being is to exist to exist is to be a being yet if we grant parmenides this seemingly necessary position he will ruthlessly drag us through a series of such devastating consequences that very little will remain of what we usually call reality right and he's thinking there in particular of the Plato's dialogue, the, Par the Parmenides, which is this long set of um, uh, dialectical uh, hypotheses things where you start for the assumption that the uh, that being is and the many only appear to be and so forth. And you take you take every possible uh, set of uh, choices for is only appears to be is not for uh, being the many, you know, change, whatever. Um, and you ring through all of them, and every single one of them ends in some kind of apparee or contradiction. Some uh, contradiction either with the previous premises or with some fact of, of perceived experience or with the nature of logic or something like that. Every single one of them is apparatic. Every single one of them issues in an impasse. And you can go back and try to find the place where there's a gap in the reasoning or a way of saving one of these hypotheses with some other you know, explanation. But on the surface of the dialogue, it is pretending that you can derive a contradiction from every single one of these uh, assumptions, right? So of every possible is or only appears to be or is not applied to uh, being one, many uh, appearances, whatever, uh, you, you, you make the total truth table of all of them and every single one of them results in a one equals zero at some point, right? Um, and uh, this is, primarily meant to demonstrate something like the uh, uh, the slipperiness of dialectical reasoning uh, or its untrustworthiness perhaps um, the uh, from the point people have different views about Parmenides himself but I think it's pretty clear that from for Parmenides himself uh, the the difficulty of following any of those chains of reasoning so any conclusion you can trust is something he is contra he Parmenides is contrasting sharply with the certainty with which you know that being is, right? So uh, all the other uh, chains of reasoning that you're going to make about things 
are going to issue in one or another opinion about which you may think you are certain, but you're not, right? Whereas you are certain that being is. Um, so there's a, there's a giant contrast between uh, the, the, the few things that you can know with certainty and a bunch of the things about which you can only speculate, Let's put it that way. So in, 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 in Parmenides' poem, right, there's, he distinguishes three ways. And the three ways are supposed to be the, the, the way of the gods, which is that being is, uh, then the way of mortals, uh, in which to be and not to be is to be the same and not the same. We'll come back to that. And then the third way is the way of the altogether not, where people think that they can speak about what is not and this way, I abjure you, do not take, right? So those are the three ways of Parmenides. There's the, the, the way of the gods, which is just that being is, he leaves practically nothing else there. The way of mortals who treat being and not being as the same and not the same, which we would put, we would say something like, we treats being as a matter of um, uh, logical similarity or contrast, something like that. Um, and he calls that the way of mortals. He says that in that way, there is no firm reliance on truth. It is the way of opinion, but it's also where almost everyone lives almost all of their lives, <laughs> right? Um, and then the third way is the, the way of those who think that they can reason about what it, what is altogether not. And he says that that just results in confusion. Um, it's impossible, he says. It's impossible to think about what is altogether not. Um, so that, that's the sort of tripartition of Parmenides. I want to point out the middle one. The middle one, the way of mortals, is uh, focused on this same concept, right? And and the the realm of opinion, the realm of seeming, the realm of the many, and the realm of treating being and not being as the same and not the same are all equated by Parmenides. Right. Um, okay. One way of understanding the relationship between Plato and Parmenides is, is Plato takes that seriously and says, well, that's the only area where we're ever going to discover anything. So now I'm going to go take the way of mortals because I'm a mortal. I'm not immortal. I'm not a god. I have to go the way of mortals and I have to reason about being and not being as the same and not the same. But consciously doing that. So he's accepted the tripartition to begin with, and he's now going to go on the way of mortals. The other way to understand them is that, especially the later Plato, um, or the Plato that's usually thought of as later, uh, the Plato of uh, the um, Iliadic stranger in, in uh, Theotetus, Sophus, and Statesman, um, will also take on Parmenides on this question of whether or not it is possible to reason about the altogether not. Right? He will tackle negation. The particular claim is that if you if you cannot reason about things which in some way are not, then you'll never catch the sophist because he's someone who uh, uh, only appear. Oh, he is a, a maker of likenesses who, uh, who 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 makes makes things which only appear to be which which are not what they appear to be. So if you cannot reason about the altogether not, you will not understand deception and you will not understand the sophist. So Plato is is. Uh, uh, agreeing somewhat with the Parmenidean tripartition, but then he's going down the way of mortals and he's also disputing whether or not you can think about the altogether not. Okay, so anyway, that's just, what's the relationship between Parmenides and Plato? Um, he's not simply a Parmenidean. He's accepting some of Parmenides' results, but then he's going in the direction that Parmenides himself did not go. Okay, so, uh, Gilson says that the notion of being that we got in Parmenides was the notion of identity, right? He said that Parmenides conceives um, being as identity. And I think there's some truth to that. Um, certainly the one is a primary Parmenidean notion. Um, Identity in the sense of the identity of the individual particulars is actually where Plato goes from Parmenides. Is all that already there in Parmenides? Not obvious. Not obvious. Um, okay, so let's let's talk a little about the Plato difference for a second. Um, Pla Plato is committed to the uh, thinking, reasoning about 
um, uh, things less than being as a whole, things less than the one, things other than that being is. He's going to take the way of mortals and he's going to accept that being and not being are the same and not the same. He's going to ask about the conceptual distinctions among things, right? And that means that he is going to think not about being, but about beings with a plural, with an S, right? What are the beings? That's the characteristic Socratic question. What is the nature of X where X is some universal? Characteristic Socratic question. Plato or Socrates' famous answer, they're ideas. What are ideas? Ideas are faces or outward looks. To Plato, to be is to be definable. It is to have a definition. It is to have an outline. It is to be particular. So uh, if the Aristotelians are the ones who thinks that the material particulars are the things which are real, the Platonists are different from the Parmenideans because the, Parmen the Platonists believe that there's more than one thing, right? There are things, there are beings, right? Beings differ one from another by having a different definition. So a different definition means a different shape, a different outward look, a different outline, a different form. And to Plato, to be is to be a particular, not in the sense of a material particular, but in the sense of a conceptual particular. One thing is distinguished from another. The, fa the thing that makes it a possible object of thought is exactly its distinctness. The fact that it's not like everything else, that it has outlines, boundaries, a definition, a shape, a form. That is the, the logical requirement for one thing to be distinguished from, from another is that you can say of the two of them, they are the same or they are not the same. They are the same if their definitions coincide. They are not the same if their definitions differ. So the definition of something and sameness or otherness applied to it, this is, this is the, uh, the definition of any given being. What then is a being to Plato? Anything which has a definition distinguished from other things by the fact that its definition is different from the definitions of all the other things. It is a sameness of a definition and an otherness from all the other definitions, right? So Plato is thinking of conceptual distinction itself as the index that runs across beings with a plural and divides them all. They are divided by their outward look, by their shape, by their definition. Now, Gilson looks at all that and he's saying, you're saying that conceptual knowledge is being or conceptual distinctness is being. And Plato's like, yep, that's exactly what I'm saying. Right? So uh, the typical objection of a typical Aristotelian is, but I want being to mean the thing I can hit with the stick of which there is one of, of a, there is this table right here. And Plato is saying, well, actually, the fact that you're calling it a table is a concept, right? That's what you're actually using to orient on it and, and react to it and understand it. Um, and you, your, your, your grand philosophical principle is that only the material particulars are real. And then Plato will tell you that material particular is not a material particular, it's a concept. Right? Exactly what you're calling real is a concept you have thrown over things to navigate them. The concept material particular. Nobody thinks that, you know, when, Plato, when Aristotle says material particulars are real, that he means material particular is a certain shaped rock you can run into in the street, right? Material particular is a conceptual structure of the world. Go ahead, Joe. Joe, you're on mute. You know you're on mute. <laughs> Joe, you have to go off mute if I'm gonna hear you. You don't know why you're on mute. Lower left corner, mute and video. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Now you're, now you're unmuted. Okay, sorry, what were you trying to ask? My, pro my, my problem are entirely with the controls for Windows 10 and all that stuff. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Uh, 
So in leaving aside your problems with, I, with, with Windows 10, what are your problems with uh, the Aristotle Plato stuff we've just been talking about? Yeah, that's what I want to get to because that's what prompted my question. And, you know, a major distraction as such I just experienced, it flushes my short term memory. Sorry. <laughs> right. I'll be, uh, I hope I'll be back to it because. I was talking so about if the real if the if for Plato, the real is what you could actually describe uh, its definition, as it were. Yes. And you cannot hit its definition with a hammer. So we're back to the table. OK, from table, what I've always thought and sort of kept in mind, even though it's only very abstract. And, uh, so little boy's knowledge is that the table is really just billions and billions of molecules and atoms. Uh, somehow they stay together and keep that shape. Mm hmm. Uh, well, you can hit it with a hammer because they keep that shape. But what's really going on here is at more at Plato's level that I'm seeing all of those molecules in their shape, and it's the shapes that sort of makes the difference here, as a really yes. a Platonic version of reality, not an Aristotelian version of reality. Yes. The claim, the, claim is, the, the claim is that the shape is the table, right? And that even the atoms are shapes. And that even the uh, the subatomic particles, uh, uh, you know, uh, in their uh, uh, quantum clouds inside the atoms are shapes, and that those things are mathematical function shapes, and that it's just shape inside shape inside shape inside shape all the way down. Okay. Right. Could I ask a question too? Just sure. To distinct things. Sure. <clears throat> How does that work with? Um... What popped in my head was non-local events, Bell's theorem. That was is that indicative of the Platonic view? Because if it's non-local and immediate, um, I, I think how does I think that I think with that? I think either I think either philosophy can deal with the facts here. Um, there are certain uh, there certainly are um, not certain. There are certain ideas about individuation, material individuation, that you get in some of the medievals that might not comport with all of the things we know from modern physics, but most of them could be made to fit, right? It's, it's not the case that physics is going to decide between these philosophies for us. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, the philosophies are, are um, uh, subtle enough and uh, uh, changeable enough that uh, any of these fundamental views could be got to comport with the, with the facts. Now, that not to say that there aren't, isn't any evidence from those things uh, on these philosophical questions. But if you're looking for a, uh, here is a fact from physics, which is incompatible with this uh, Platonic notion of being, or is incompatible with this Aristotelian notion of being, or this uh, Aquinian notion of being, you're not going to find it. Because the, the the philosophers are going to have a patch for that problem. Right? Damn it. Because um, <laughs> I want to destroying Aristotelian thought. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the, the, it, I, I can tell you the things which I, I, I like best for, you know, uh, think, things which are curious facts for the Aristotelians to, uh, to, to explain. The, the one that they all cared about in the Middle Ages isn't the one that we care about these days. It was just when the world was eternal. From the standpoint of the medievals, Aristotle was the philosopher who taught that the world was eternal, and Plato was the philosopher who taught that the world had a beginning in time. Um, and, you know, that was that was the... The, the, the fundamental physical prediction of the two of them, so to speak. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, these days we'd care more about others more subtle than that probably. But uh, uh, I first just want to get at this point about uh, what the Platonists are saying about um, the nature of being. Gilson is entirely right about them, that they want beingness to be something like conceptual definability and there's nothing, um, there's no slippage between the conceptual machinery if the, if, the, if the concepts are accurate and the world behind them, right? They, they, they think that if you, if you could think with sufficient clarity uh, the same thoughts that made or are the nature of the world, uh, you would uh, not be trying to uh, navigate a foreign reality with a, uh, with a very crude map, you would be, uh, it, it, in in the code that made the matrix, so to speak, right? You would you you could you could know the actual uh, the actual conceptual bones of the world. Um, okay, uh, we do have to bring out a little bit of the contrast between Parmenides and 
Plato on this, right? So uh, the, the first is about one, right? So we're gonna see a bunch of stuff later when we get to the later Neoplatonists and so forth, where they're gonna start distinguishing between one and being. And the, uh, in, in Parmenides, they're closer to being equivalent, right? Parmenides is the, is the philosopher of the one. He's also the philosopher of being. And he's the philosopher who says that being and identity are the same, right? Um, and later you'll get ones with a plural in Plato. And then later still Neoplatonists will go back to a single one and we'll discover that the single one is no longer being but is above being or beyond being. And a lot of that will have to do with Plato having happened in the meantime. Okay, and some of this is related back to the stuff we were talking about in the Heidegger stuff about ontological difference and is there something beyond being and uh, even the being of beings and so forth. We have to talk about the one to get there. One is something like a platonic idea that makes things that are one be one, right? And makes is like the wrong material uh, 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 idea here because these are well, these are concepts. They're they're more like uh, they're not even they're not even sets. They're they're more like uh, uh, functions that operate, right? Um, so uh, something has the quality of oneness if and has been made one if it participates in one, right? And the claim is that everything which has an identity does this, right? So. Uh, uh, all, all of the all of the real things have being. All the things which are definable have oneness, something like that. Um, and uh, the later medievals, scholastics I'm thinking in particular, and people like um, Duns Scotus in particular, talk about these as the the transcendental categories, the transcendental concepts. Uh, we'll talk about why they call them transcendental in just a second. But these are things like. Uh, one being same and other, uh, um, finite and infinite, etc. These are uh, concepts that wind up applying to every concept or actual that you can think. There's something like there's something like the necessary structures of thinkability itself, right? Um, and long before these were thought of as just illusions of logic or illusions of language, they were thought of as being the bones of the world, right? The, the, this, this, the scholastic understanding of the transcendentals is that they are concepts that apply equally to infinite being and finite being. Uh, they mostly mean God by infinite being, but um, infinite or finite being doesn't matter. These concepts apply on either side of that distinction. If that's the case, then it's a transcendental concept to Duns Scotus. That's what he means by the word. As opposed to all the facts you know about frogs, right? None of the facts you know about frogs apply to infinite being, right? <laughs> uh, but that frogs are or not, are one or are not one, uh, uh, are, are, are same or different, these are not facts which are true only of frogs or only of other finite beings, right? Well, uh, what about unicorns? Yes, very good question. Uh, uh, the, 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 the example he gives, instead of a unicorn, he gives an example of a uh, um, Mrs. Gamp. Uh, Mrs. Gamp oh, yeah. is a character in, uh, in, in uh, Dickens who is a... Uh, um, the archetype of the of the bad nurse before Florence Nightingale reformed nursing, um, who is uh, drunk all the time and doesn't care very much and is just staggering around the hospital, you know, bossing patients around and you know, uh, uh, only living for her dram, right? So M Mrs. Gamp is this ideal type of a of a bad nurse, um, uh, and and the question is asked, you know, is Miss Gamp real or not, right? And the claim is that. Um, to many of the readers, Mrs. Gamp is more real than most of the nurses they could actually meet in the street, right? <laughs> um, and from the standpoint of Mrs. Uh, of Mr. Dickens, he says, uh, "Of course, Miss, uh, uh, Mrs. Gamp is real. Uh, he, he undoubtedly drew her from life and had uh, scores of, of of nurses that had this or that aspect of Mrs. Gamp that he extracted from them to create the character of Mrs. Gamp, 
right? <laughs> but you cannot look up Mrs. Gamp at, you know, uh, 21 Baker Street and find her. Uh, 21 Baker Street, of mm -hmm. course, being another fictional address, right? So the, 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 the point is, 21B, there you go. The, 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 the point is that uh, um, uh, these are examples of things which uh, are in some sense conceptually speaking, but are not in some other sense actually speaking, right? So the, 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 the later medievalists would say that uh, unicorns are not real and they're not actual. Mrs. Gamp might be real, but she's not actual. Um, or her actuality is as a fictional character in a Dickens novel, right? Um, the, some of the later uh, scholastics will say, they have a, a set of distinctions, which we'll get to like in chapter four. Um, something, something is, uh, if something is a possible existent, right? It has to not be a, a, mere, uh, a, a mere conceit of reason, right? Uh, uh, it has to not be a, a, an, an illusion or phantasm or a mere conceit of reason, right? But if it's a possible existent which currently doesn't exist, then it's possible. And all of its relations are then real, but they might not be actual, right? So um, bridges you haven't built yet that would not fall down in your engineering class are possible in that sense in a way that Mrs. Gamp is not. This is the claim. They are possible. Okay, so existence. an absent, an absent grandpa who normally lives at home, his, 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 all his relations are still there. His absence is the thing that's new to the scene. Uh, he's still real. I mean, uh, so uh, yeah, real is, is is less the term, but yes, uh, the the. Uh, all of this is going to eventually get us into the questions of possible and actual, right? When we get to Aristotle, who's going to try to solve all this with questions of possibility. But from from the standpoint of uh, the Platonists, is something is a pos is a, a a set of possible conceptual things, it's already a being and real. So mm -hmm. the 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 paradigm examples of that are you know things in mathematics, right? Groups. Rings, fields, they're real to a, to a, to a Platonist, right? Um, and nobody thinks that you have to uh, be able to run into one in the street, right? Uh, or that you even, or that one has to be, it has to be possible to make an instance of it. The thing that you would make as an instance of it would be an imperfect copy. It wouldn't be the actual ideal mathematical object. And the true relations that obtain among the, uh, for the actual mathematical object, do not depend in any way on being able to make a, a, a poor copy of it. None of the none of the truths of Euclid depend upon how well you can draw triangles. Right? So th that's that's the standard that the Platonists are thinking of. And when it comes to things like unicorns, right? Um, is it possible for a unicorn to exist? Um, uh, there might be some reasons of, 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 of shape why, why the answer is no, but probably it is the answer is yes. And they would regard it as, as having a concept in that sense, right? Um, the, the, the late scholastics would say, only if some future uh, a bioengineer could actually make one in a lab, right? Otherwise, no. But the, the Aristotelians, on the other hand, are gonna be inclined to say, uh, no, um, unicorns are not real. And uh, uh, it's extremely unlikely that any future bio a bioengineer will ever make one um, because they're, uh, they're, they're, they're unreal fictions to begin with. Okay, but um, excellent question about the, the, fictional, the fictional character, the being the fictional character. Um, the, from the standpoint of Plato, the fictional character is real but not actual. Right. And one of the reasons this matters, especially to, I'd say, Plato and some of the Neoplatonists is the Neoplatonists have the notion that things which are not real, not even not real, not real, right, 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 things which are not actual act. This is the funniest thing about Platonism. Um, this is why Platonism winds up getting called idealism later in the naive sense of idealism in the sense that someone is an idealist because they want to change the world, right? Um, uh, uh, there is a notion of action in Plato, especially coming out of things like uh, 
uh, discussion of love and eros in the symposium, and that is made much of by the later um, Neoplatonists. Um, the attractiveness of things which do not exist acts in the world. This is the claim. The thing you want to have occur changes the world by the fact that you want it, right? So uh, it is, uh, they're, they're not uh, pushing from behind efficient causation people that think that only things which are actual get a chance to influence the world. They are also final cause idealists who think that merely beautiful or attractive or good things that are sought in front of you uh, uh, determine uh, facts about the world, right? Uh, the, the, the platonic way of putting that is that the good acts, the, the good acts it, in part it, by being attractive to rational minds. Go ahead, Joe. This, this, this sounds like uh, build it and they will come, you know. A little bit, but it's even more than that. It's, it's conceive in your mind the thing that you would want to have, and it is already influencing you. Well, that's just, that's just isn't that just the power of positive thinking or something? But yeah. I, I can see what the point. Mm, yeah, a little bit. Jim, question. Jim, you're on mute. Still on mute. I'm not sure it would be as simple as the power of positive thinking because via Heidegger, we, we have to say that a world actually has to exist with beings in it for us to conceive of something that should be or we'd want it to be. We'd have to have a world in which for that to occur as opposed to just this is the world I'm in, I'm stuck in it, and I, I want to be positive about my circumstances, which is the way I would uh, define positive thinking. So I, different... I'm, going to, I'm going to partly agree with you, but I'm going to point out that, that uh, um, Heidegger's in this regard way more uh, uh, material Aristotelian, uh, this world already is sort of than the Platonists are. Um, because mm -hmm. by the time you're at the Neoplatonists, they'll they, they will claim that the existence of the world is down to the same kind of causation of the desired coming into being. Um, so we'll get, Alex, welcome. Um, so, uh, but the, 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 point, the point is that um, the, the reality of the desired that is not actual is very much one of the things that the Platonists are including, right? in their concept of real. Alex, you have a question? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, hi. Sorry, I was, uh, hi. Uh, no, came no in late and I actually, just, I just saw the event earlier today, so I haven't done any of the readings, but uh, okay. I'm familiar a little bit with uh, some of the issues. Um, I was wondering about, <clears throat> excuse me, um, um, so we have this distinction between the real and the actual, and the real is a broader concept. Right, For the most, real yes. includes possibles, possibles as well as actuals. It's not simply uh, a question of broader because they're they they're uh, they're different distinctions. So all four boxes are occupied, in the sense that you can have things which are neither actual nor real. You can have things which are actual but not real, and so forth. Right, um, because they're right. different distinctions. Um, so it's not simply the case that everything actual is contained in the real. Um, but uh, uh, at least conceptually, you may have particular philosophers who make claims like uh, that one is contained in the other, et cetera. But the, 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 right. the original scholastic distinction, one of the actual to be um, transpiring in time and the real to be uh, independent of the, um, of the contents or opinions of any one mind, right? So there's a sense of the real as we would say some, we tend to say the object, but that's not really the right objective, but that's not really the right word because they're uh, thinking about it distinct from the mind that's conceiving it, which the notion the object already includes. But um, the, the, the real doesn't care about who is thinking what about it. It's not a matter of opinion, right? And the actual um, uh, transpires in time those are the two actual distinctions involved. Right. Is um, that what they would have called subsistence? 
I've heard this word okay. from the medievals that yeah. some things different, exist, yeah. but then different, some things subsist. Different, different thoughts. So subsists really becomes, it's definitely used by the medievals, but it, it's, it comes in first with the Stoics in the uh, Hellenic era, basically, uh, and Alexandrian era. Um, and it's a, a key term in Stoic logic. Um, something subsists if it does not, if it is incapable of existing in its own right, but uh, um, is or appears as long as its substrate allows it to. So the perfect example of the qualia, the way that the color appears to you, right? Um, uh, the, ac the accidents of substance um, and how broad the uh, category of what subsists as opposed to exists is, is one of the things that the medieval spent a lot of time worrying about. But the fundamental notion of subsist is that you have something which is not such a being that it, it can exist independently in its own right. But if its substrate and requirements are there, it occurs. So in that sense, it is actual, but it requires something else in order to be. And not just as a cause that, you know, made it be that way rather than some other way, but to uh, uh, appear, be metaphysically supported at all. Now, some of them thought that the things which subsist are objects of thought or mental distinction only, that they have to be abstracted away from the actual existence so that the things which subsist are creatures of thought but not all of them thought that. But certainly if we're talking about, you know, how, how the color blue appears to me, right? That is not something that can exist independent of my mind, mm -hmm. as well as something blue appearing to me, right? It exists as a relation between two other existent things and it cannot exist without either component of that relation. So the Stoics would say mm -hmm. that sense of how blue this blue looks to me right now subsists. It does not exist. That help? Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, can I raise another question? Uh, sure, something else sure. I was wondering. Um, so with the um, with the real and actual. Uh, so as as we were as you guys were talking about the like fictional objects, yes. I was also thinking, okay, what what about uh, contradictory objects? Yes. Like you know the round square. Yes. And is that a case where a Platonist would say, well, that doesn't even, that's not even real. Yes. That doesn't even have a coherent concept. So that just yes. falls beyond. Even, that's even exactly, that's, that's exactly what the Platonist would, would say is, is it an unreal? Yes. Um, and, and there, there, are, um, uh, he mentions it later in chapter one, uh, uh um, he's thinking of, uh, uh, John Scott, John the Scott, uh, in, uh, um, as a medieval Neoplatonist who gives a, uh, um, a whole history, a uh, uh, history of the, not a history uh, on the nature of things. He writes a, a big book, right? And he wants to include in it all the things, uh, all the natures. And for him, nature is a broader term than beings because some of the things which have natures aren't beings, right? Um, uh, but uh, Pl Plato in, uh, in the sophist is, uh, has a whole long section on the may on the, 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 not the, the things which aren't and, but in some sense are right. There's some sense of being that the things which aren't have. And there he's thinking particularly of illusions, um, of, uh, lies, uh, falsehoods of various kinds. Um, and he has a whole doctrine of, of, uh, the, 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 the icon versus the phantasm, right. To, to explain um, uh, or to try to explain uh, the notion of some some sense of being for something which is not, right? And that's the sort of the theme of the sophist because the claim is that the sophist is someone who um, appears to make everything that is, but doesn't actually make it. Um, yeah, the, 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 that, then that fall in the first of, of Parmenides' tripartite division of things that are- All together not. Because we have man in the middle, but so yeah, so 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 nice. yeah this is this we, we were back, going back to parmenides parmenides laid out that there's the uh, uh uh the divine way that being is the way of mortals in which uh being and not being are the same and not the same and then the path of the altogether not which tries to reason about things which are not right and right. in like in the so squares it, 
in this in the sophist, um, that's exactly what um, what uh, Plato, the the uh, Eleatic stranger, tried to do is to try to reason about the may on the the not being. Um, uh, yeah, so so uh, uh, fi fictional things, um, think things which merely appear. The, the the there's a famous there's a famous image in in the in the sophist right which is the uh, um, the the Eleatic stranger tells Theaetetus the young Theaetetus he's talking to um, that the uh, sophist will claim to be able to make everything that is um, effortlessly uh, uh, and on demand and Theaetetus says that's impossible and the sophist you know, uh, says but I can do it I can just hold a mirror and spin around really fast right. Um, and uh, the, 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 the claim is that by, by making fleeting uh, uh, visual copies of the external reality of things, you're making the thing, is the kind of claim that the sophist is advancing. And the sophist is doing that less with a material mirror and more with words. But he's making word copies of things that are as fleeting and as unreal as the images in the mirror are compared to the things themselves. But he thinks that his purely verbal explanations of things that way is making the things themselves. So this, what about this the is the Star Trek replicator. Yes. Well, the, but my point is that this is, this is, this is the, this is the, the archetype of the may on in, 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 in the sophist, right? If you, if you make uh, uh, copies of things by flashing mirrors at them, or if you make copies of things by throwing thin conceptual nets of words over them that, that purport to be what the thing is, but, but, but once you get up close to them, aren't anything like the actual thing, right? Those are the paradigm examples of the may on, of the things which are not. And the, the doctrine towards the end of the dialogue will be that it's not that those things are not completely, because in some way they are, but they're not what they appear to be. They, they enact a deception precisely between uh, the, um, the way that, uh, logical language tries to refer to things and the things to which it refers. Um, yeah, like, like fake news or putting the spin on things. Right. But this is, this is, there's a whole doctrine of, of how that's possible. What, because you have, you have to see how this is a problem for Platonism, right? Because Platonism wants to say that the conceptual version of something can actually be the thing, right? If you're if you're anomalous and you think that all your conceptual versions of something are, are going to be you know uh, uh, faint uh, uh, copies of a few aspects of the things that you made up on the spot and you know decided to abstract and you've left behind 99% of everything, then there's no problem here, right? But as soon as you think that you can conceptually get the whole actual thing, then you have to explain uh, all the ways in which. Uh, um, uh, verbal understanding of things fails to be the things themselves, right? And that's what the sophist is about as a dialogue. Okay, so, so, um, uh, okay. Uh, he mentions, he mentions the, uh, I want to just get on this you see, you, you see a business. So the, the um, thanks for the uh, uh, questions. Uh, Alex, do you have another one or should we keep going? Oh, I'm good for now. Thanks. Okay, sure. Um, uh, did you guys follow? Uh, I don't know what happened, to Jim. Uh, follow the uh, the Usia discussion. Do you know the term Usia? Yeah, page reference. Uh, we're on page just seventeen. Yeah, I was. My mind was following up at that point. It's when we got the plot list that it sort of flogged over. Right. So I mean, he, he's talking about the the, the, the chestnuts of uh, of participation, right? But um, he, the typical when I say chestnuts, I mean the the typical things that are discussed in in uh, every Platonic dialogue about how you know the idea of X, of X is uh, uh, a a uh, a unity over all of the X's, right? And Gilson is partly here just uh, showing his own his own uh, difficulty with that. Um, But the uh, what I'm trying to get at, what I'm trying to get at is is the um, uh, the, wor the word the uh, word usia. It's it's something like beingness, um, 
uh, he, he, uh, he, Gilson, is frequently translating it as real, which is a really bad translation. Um, uh, but beingness would be close to it. Um, substance is also close to it. The, 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 in, in colloquial Greek, the word um, is, is, is used for a, a synonym for wealth. You say he is a man of substance, right? Um, and you use the same word for beingness. So it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an, an ingness attached to a, uh, a one thing, right, an on. You take an on and then you, you ingness it, right? And you get this word. And this word is translated as beingness or as substance. Um, substance is the word that um, Aristotle will make famous for it. But uh, uh, the, the question here is, uh, to what degree is the, um, uh, the, the, the conceptual definition of the thing and its substance the same? Right, because the, the, the Platonists want the, uh, the, the conceptual uh, uh, de definitiveness of the thing to be its beingness, right? It's not, the beingness is not something that, that, the, that the being has, right? The, the, con the conceptual distinctness of it is its beingness. And one way to think about this is to imagine that your, uh, your typical Platonist is a very, uh, a very visual thinker, right? And he's thinking in, in, uh, in set theory terms and, and what is contained in what, right? And he takes very literally and imagely all these notions of definition as outline and idea as outward face or surface. Right? And he imagines that the, the outline of the thing is the definition of the thing, is what determines the thing. And what I mean by the substance of the thing is that shape filled with beingness. Right? So you, you imagine there's a, in a terrain of purely conceptual distinctness, right? there's the is occupied or is not occupied, right? along what are, whatever axis of distinction you like, whatever cross-cutting axes of distinction you like in this set, not in this set. And the in this setness, the contained within this definitionness of something imagined as uh, full of beingness, right? It's the, it's the shaded region on the Venn diagram, right? It's the shading and the shaded region on the Venn diagram that the, that the Platonists are calling beingness. It's the fact that you shade this part as contained within this definition, right? That's what they're meaning by beingness. Um, okay, so in a sense, that substance in a later sense of all the conceptual distinctions you can make about the thing will be things which can which that thing can stand under, because um, all those conceptual distinctions you can make about the thing are your different you know cross cutting sets, right? Uh, uh, you know that it is contained in, right? Um, so it's it's the underlying area or region of logical space that supports all of those attributes, so to speak. Right. So, um, and I think it's fair to say that this sort of uh, geometrical imaginative way of understanding sort of logical space is what's behind this um, conceptual version of what being is in the Platonists. Um, okay. A question uh, about this. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Going back, um, maybe also to Aristotle a little bit. Um, so one way that this is framed here, I think this is on 17, um, where, um, so I guess in Plato, reality and intelligibility get kind of equated. Yes. And what things really are, is their kind of conceptual essence? Yes. And... and and, and, and then, we're just talking about why that happens, right? That, that happens because distinctness as such, having a definition, having a shape, having a form, are the uh, beingness of things for Plato, right? Mm -hmm. Something is a being because it is distinct from everything else because it has a definition. Right. right? So what, what right. distinguishes being from the whole continuum of possible is it is that which falls within this outline or shape. 
that which meets these cri these logical criteria, that which fits inside these set locations, right? It is what falls under this definition. And what we mean by a being is a particular one distinguished from everything else that is possible, whose distinguishing mark is this definition actually applies to it. Right? So if you if right. that's your definition of what it means for something to be a being, then being and logical cons uh, uh, intelligibility are going to coincide. Right, right. And so I guess what happens with Aristotle, um, it seems to me Aristotle retains a notion of forms. He does. Right? Uh, essences. But for him, the material principle becomes important. And so I don't know if this is actually authentic Aristotle or if it's the medievals, but you have the distinction between essence and then existence yes. as two we're gonna get principles. To, we're we're going to get to existence way later. Uh, we're going to get to Aristotle in chapter two, which is next time. Uh, Ar Aristotle is uh, Aristotle and the Aristotelian notion of substance is exactly what chapter two is about. And it's sort of later, later medieval echoes. But the particular essence existence distinction of the later medievals we'll get to even later, right? But mm -hmm. uh, to, to begin with, Aristotle wants to start from the idea that Plato's ideas are abstractions and he can't tell me where they are. Whereas my material particulars I know are real, but what do I know about my, my material particulars? The answer is I know their outline and their shape and that they are sub substance that is put together of they are some substance that is put together of a matter and a form, and everything, everything uh, about the form of those material particulars works exactly the same way Plato's ideas and definitions and sets do. The formal aspect mm -hmm. of the substance works exactly the way Plato thinks form does in general, but only for things which already are as particulars that are put together of a matter and a form. And that's, that's what Aristotle mean by substance. Substance is the thing which has both a matter and a form. And because it has a matter, it isn't just an abstract form anymore. It's not just a, it's not just a uh, mathematical abstraction off in the realm of Plato's ideas, right? It, it has some actual material particularity in timidness to it, right? And the, the, uh, to what degree it is purely the matter that is lending this in timeness to it is something that they'll all, you know, puzzle about quite a bit. Um, but the, the, um, the substance being real because it has something else besides a form and that form is the matter and in timidness that just differentiates it as an individual is what Aristotle is going to be about. And that's why the mm -hmm. medievals will talk about matter as being the principle of individuation. What they mean is you can have 16 different copies of, uh, of, a, of a Nissan Sentra, but this particular one is differentiated from the other ones, not by its shape, but by its matter. All the Nissan Sentras have the same platonic form, but this Nissan Sentra is made out of these molecules, not those molecules. So it's a different one. So, so it would the, be like the thisness, the thisness, or the, uh, the, the this uh, this thisness winds up getting used as a term of art by uh, Duns Scotus even later. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but in Aristotle, it's the matter rather than the, than the, the than the thisness that is the principle oh, okay. of individuation, right? Right. Thisness winds up getting distinguished from matter. But to Aristotle, you know, the, mm. the, uh, there is a certainly a thisness about the matter, but. Uh, he, he just says the matter that it's made out of is the individuator, right? Um, we would say the, ins the, the instanceizer, right? What makes it this instance of this idea? Answer this matter in this, you know, in, in this period of time over here, right? right? There's a time and a spatial component of a distribution of an underlying matter, which makes the thing be a substance. Uh, that's that there's there, there is not just what is not just the form into which something is formed, but the what is formed, the matter that is uh, what what is formed. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, one of the points that Gilson will make by the end of chapter two, though, is that because he treats all of the logical relations among the about the shapes of things as being 
all the things from which their natures and properties derive, um, you can almost treat a Aristotelian world like a platonic world. It's just that instead of thinking about concepts that are classes over all objects, you just think about the shapes of the individual objects. Right. But you think about the and shapes. You think about the shapes of the individual objects the same way Plato thinks about shapes in general. Right, and so this, I guess, would be how Aristotle is di is different from any pre-Socratic materialist, that he yes. actually brings the whole Platonic structure. In a sense, he kind of brings it down to the world. He does. Uh, he's he's he's, he's retaining it. he's retaining a huge amount of the of the uh, of the Platonic conceptual machinery and you see this especially in his logic right mm -hmm. uh and is you know and it's things like the uh, uh posterior analytics he'll say that you know there can't be any proper scientific knowledge of anything which is affected by the category of time which is not the thing you think of from material particular uh, a materialist or a material particularist right uh, it, mm -hmm. that's a side effect of his platonism of his residual platonism if you like um there's other places with his visual residual Platonism in, in, in Aristotle. Um, but the other thing that Aristotle brings to it, to all this, is he's going to bring in notions of um, the acts of the substance. He's got this whole theory of actualization and this whole theory of, uh, of, of activity, of energeia, um, this whole uh, theory of what it means to be in time, right? The in-timeness of things, um, which is, you know, he's elaborating all that to try to tie all this conceptual stuff up to um, something more like physics rather than mathematics, right? Um, but the result is he, ne he needs an entire theory of the difference between the potential and the actual, the acts that the individual um, uh, substance performs and the, the, the act whereby something uh, is what it is, is what will later become existence in the in the later medievals but the there the there's this uh emphasis on the material particular on the substance on the on the matter being formed together and on the in timeness of things in aristotle which all go along with this focus on the material particular um okay uh yeah but that's you know w one to three chapters ahead <laughs> but a good question um uh, all right, so I'm assuming from uh, other things I heard from Joe that the real problems in this chapter started for many of you when we got to the Plotinus part, when we got to the Neoplatonism versus Platonism. I want, I want to leave one other thing though before we get there, which is um, Plato's good and the notion of the good being beyond being already in Plato. So we, we, already, we already noticed this in, uh, couple sessions ago when we were doing the Heidegger stuff and we noticed that uh, uh, Heidegger runs across the place where Plato says that uh, um, the good is beyond being and within one paragraph he says so the good must be the being of the beings um, because the only thing that uh, Heidegger can think of that is beyond beings is actually he says beyond being uh, that is beyond being is the ontological difference of being with a capital B as opposed to the being of the beings. So Plato says, what I'm talking about is beyond being and within you know, one page, Heidegger reads, so you're talking about being then, right? He can't think of beyond being, being's his highest category. And this is gonna come up again. This is gonna come up in a lot of the, I'm gonna put it this way, the ontotheology we'll get in the second half of this chapter and in some of um, Gilson's objections to any of this. But I, I, uh, I, go, Joe. So, oh, I was just thinking about uh, the Luthero uh, dialogue. You know, is is the, the gods love it because it's good, or is it good because the gods love it? Occam brought that up too. Yes. Uh. Uh. So. Uh, but that place places good above or below God, I guess. The to 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 Plato, we can talk about what Gilson says about it in just a second, but um. The, the, the later Platonists, either they are neo, neo, neo Platonists, either put God just below the good or as the good. Um, mm -hmm. There's a place here where uh, um, uh, Gilson says 
that there are some people that claim that Plato thought that the good was God, but they have no text they can point to for this, so we don't have to take this idea seriously, <laughs> right? Um, this is only mostly true, right? There, there's a, there's a uh, passage in uh, the second letter, which is uh, kind of says something like this. But uh, uh, in any event, the, the, the places where people put anything that they want to call God is something we'll definitely get to heavily in the whole second half of the chapter. But before we get to uh, uh, ascribing or denying godliness to things, we first just have to get the actual platonic scheme of uh, one good and being straight. In the platonic scheme, as opposed to the neoplatonic scheme, the highest idea is the idea of the good. No question. And being comes after it. He says that the, that the idea of the good is uh, not only more powerful, but older than being. The word is actually older. It's always translated as, as, as uh, um, something like uh, more, more august or more uh, um, honorable, right? But the actual word is the, is, is the word older. It's elder. It's uh, presbyter, the same word as presbyter, presbyterians, right? Presbyterians want the church to be run by the elders, right? He, he says that uh, the, the, uh, the good is older uh, as well as more powerful than being. Um, that's in the uh, Re Republic. And there's other places where the idea of the good comes up, but it, it's very clear in Plato that his scheme is good is above beings and even says that uh, uh, the good is that which provides beings their being. It not only, cause, it not only causes their intelligibility, it causes their existence. He doesn't actually say existence, he says being, but whatever, causes their being. Now, and there's no question that uh, at this point, Gilson just does not understand Plato, right? He's not a Platonist himself, doesn't get what he's saying, right? Uh, he says on page 20, um, uh, the really real then hangs upon something that is not real. The perfectly knowable hangs upon something that is not knowable. And whichever name we may choose to call their ultimate principle, be it the one of the good, the fact remains that being an intelligible no longer reigns supreme. After following as far as it can see, the human mind loses their tracks, and they seem indeed to lose themselves in the darkness of some supreme non-being and of some supreme unintelligibility. Right? So uh, there's some justice to that, but mostly it's a confession that Gilson cannot follow. Right? I follow that. That's about the time that I began to wonder why is he going back and forth and <laughs> <laughs> he, the, the the idea that the good is beyond being is unintelligible to Gilson. Right? He is not alone in this. Right? It is uh, as he as he points out, uh, Plato's good was a byword in the ancient world for a very obscure idea. <laughs> um, but why why does uh, why does Plato uh, say the good is beyond being? Any thoughts? Guesses? Nobody has a It certainly idea. would encompass the things that are imaginable and possible and could be brought into being, or you know, brought from being into the into actuality. That is definitely one reason. He is he is he is oh. he notices the fact that the way that mind acts in the world is not by just something which was in any antecedent sense, but that things which are not act via mind on the world. That is he's certainly definitely one positing of good. He's definitely positing good in, in the normal way we think Plato would do. But uh, it's, definite, it's different from how I think any modern person does use it, because we think about uh, uh, something a good hammer, you know, when you get to the, to the being level, it becomes very specific. You know, it's useful for its purpose. But higher than that, uh, you begin to ask yourself the question about, uh, you know, am I awake? Well, that's a question that's covered. Is it imaginary? Well, that's a question that's covered. Uh, is it mathematical? That's one that is, uh, anchors a bit better. But I'm going to let you talk. So, so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm always I'm always eager to hear what people say. Uh, uh, think think about this because it's I agree it's an obscure idea, right? Um, sorry, Alex, you had a question. Uh, just to uh, try to answer your question about um, why, I guess I can think of a reason why the one 
might be beyond being. And that is that uh, if every being has oneness and is defined by a kind of self-containment, then you need to ask, well, where does that come from? Yes. And the one would be the source of the identity of things. Yes. Um, so, so you're right. That's exactly the way that the Neoplatonists will think about the relationship between one and being, like people like Plotinus. And it's why they will say that the one is clearly beyond being. But they're also going to wind up equating, in the case of Plotinus, that one with Plato's good, because Plato's good was already a concept that was placed beyond being, not necessarily for that reason. Um, and then some of the even later Neoplatonists might uh, put the good somewhere else in that hierarchy and put the one highest. Some will actually put the nothing highest, and then the one, and then the good, and then the, you know, et cetera. But the, uh, yes, one oneness has to be uh, given to beings for them to have an identity and to be. That thought is already there in Parmenides. So that a being, as opposed to being tout core, that a being is distinct, requires a supervening oneness, where by supervening we mean in some purely conceptual kind of set theoretical interpenetration of the forms sense, right? part of the conceptual idea of a being that it have identity and therefore that it have oneness, right? And yes, that is one sense in which they would at least be co-eval. It's not clear that one is based upon the other from that, but it is clear that you can't have a being without a oneness. Okay. And so, you might think so that would might... be the same. Go ahead. So that would be the same with the good. Um, in order to understand being, you have to have something beyond it, which is the good. To ultimately understand being there has to be something else that it's not it's not defined. it's not clear why though it's not because the the um there's two things actually going on here one is the thought that um there is a thought likeness or mindliness of things that are that is already being uh thought of along with goodness and the other is that if when he tries to tell you what the heck goodness is it means something like um, appropriate measure. The place he comes closest to talking about the, 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 the definition of good is the philebus, and it's something like measure. So the notion that the good is necessary for uh, beings is something like uh, to have a definition, they not only have to have an identity, that identity has to be the appropriate measure of their particularity or difference from everything else. The appropriateness of the measure of this outline for this being is a prior appropriateness. No beings distinct from each other without a prior appropriateness that makes that the shape that is that being. So an intelligibility coming from an appropriate measure, which is also being related to the idea of that, the appropriateness of that measure being beautiful, all of those are kind of what he is talking about by the idea of the good. So just as oneness, as Alex pointed out, is something that beings have to have in order to ha be distinct enough to be, to Plato, the appropriateness of the measure of their outline and the thought-like intelligibility of them are also things that beings have to have in order to be. And both of those are the things which he's calling the good about them. So there, there, there is a good in things in their intelligible, appropriate distinctness, something like that. Um, and then he's uh, went in the, uh, in the Republic part where he's talking about this, he's, he says that uh, this is what gives beings not only their goodness, but their very being. And the point of that is that they would not be distinct, but for this appropriate definite, this appropriateness of definition. The appropriateness of the, the appropriateness of the definition of the thing to the thing uh, it, it is, is the being of that thing as opposed to it being something else. Okay. This is all incredibly abstract, and 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 uh, uh, Gilson is right to say that most people lo lose their tracks in the darkness of some supreme non-being, right? But 
Why is this a non-being to him? It's a non-being to him, to Plato that is, because he is unpacking the notion of to be a being into its logical constituent parts. He is, he is factoring something being a being into what it conceptually needs to be let, to be that way. In the same way that you would, you know, take apart a material particular into, you know, its form and its substance and its surface and its attributes and its categorical, you know, determinations, whatever. Plato is doing that with the notion of a thing and not a particular a material thing, but, you know, a conceptual thing. And he is finding a goodness under underneath that. Now, the fact that that thing underneath it is a goodness is partly this measure business, but it's also partly this thought likeness business. There's no question that intelligibility, thinkability are being uh, given a valorization in all of this, right? It is better to be intelligible than to be unintelligible in this understanding of what goodness is. Um, okay, but this is this is something about what's going on in this obscure idea of the good and the and and for this reason, oneness and goodness are both things that the, that this strain of Platonism are thinking of as metaphysically prior to being. Metaphysically prior in the sense that it is not that first things are and then they have the attributes of goodness, or first they are and they have the attributes of identity, but that goodness, sorry, but that identity, sorry, that beingness is, is, is composed out of uh, an identity, a oneness, uh, and a goodness that are required for a thing to be a being. Okay. So like Alex said, would they subsist then in goodness? <laughs> no, uh, no, uh, th these are, the, the, these are the, the uh, fair question, but the, 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 the way that they actually think about it is that um, uh, once a being in this sense uh, exists, it doesn't need these relations, none of these relations are in, in time relations, right, to the Platonists. Um, so, uh, yes, it's an unpacked structure in the sense, and so there are overlying attributes that are results of underlying attributes in much the same way that subsistent things are over the things in which they exist. Um, that's correct. The, 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 but it's not that um, once so constituted, they need this to continue to be, something like that. There are, there will be a later uh, mm -hmm. discussion between uh, Scotus and Aquinas in particular about uh, the degree to which these metaphysical supports, so to speak, require continual operation in order to exist, to what degree the fully constituted being doesn't need those things to exist. Um, and uh, Scotus will famously come down on the side that uh, once the being is so constituted, it doesn't need anything else. Right, it exists in its own right. Um, but uh, this is also you know, related to uh, uh, theological doctrines of continuous creation or single creation and so forth. But way down the road, the the, the, the first thing to understand okay. is just is just that the the beyond being that is already there in Plato is uh, maybe easier to conceptualize as Alex saw in the case of the one than of the good. But for Plato, the important piece of it is the that it is the good that is beyond being, um, and the that a, that a one or with Parmenides you get a one that basically coincides with being. With the Neoplatonists, you get a one which is beyond being. In between, in Plato, you get a good that's beyond being, that is only going to get equated to the one by Plotinus. Right? It's Plotinus who makes the equation. The one that uh, is prior to being, uh, for all of the uh, uh, Parmenidean reasons, is also uh, prior to is, is is prior to it in the same way that the good is prior to it, and good and one coincide as the thing which is higher than being. Okay, Alex. Quick question about um, so so the good. Um, I guess there are two things that come out of that. One is this uh, sense of kind of mindedness. That you were pointing to, uh, yes. which I guess is a way of maybe like a kind of a prototype of teleology, 
right? Absolutely. But, uh, Absolutely. It is teleology. Right. Right. And, and, um, and the original origin of this is actually Anaxagoras, who was like Socrates' teacher. So Anaxagoras was of, of the of the physicists who said that all is something. He was the one who said all is mind. And Anaxagoras was, you know, immensely attracted to him because he didn't say it was water or air or fire or something like that. That 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 uh, Socrates said, I had no hope of ever being able to understand. This is in the uh, um, uh, what are his deathbed uh, one. I forget forget the name. Um, Phaedo in the Phaedo. Um, he says, I, I liked uh, Anaxagoras because he says all is mind. And then I figured that he was going to go on and give me explanations that such and such is the case because it's better that it's this way than that way. And then that would make perfect sense. But since all is mind, things being the way they should be is would be a perfectly adequate explanation, explanation for something. And th that's Socrates explaining why he was attracted to the all is mind thought in, in Anaxagoras. It's precisely because he wants to be able to reason teleologically about things. Right? right. So being able to reason teleologically, uh, seeing a, a mind controlling the all uh, and seeing the good as being beyond being are correlate ideas. And the 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 uh, all is mind notion is already there in Anaxagoras and Socrates picks it up and see, thinks that Anaxagoras has not really made adequate use of it and he will. And he teaches us that there's a good be that's beyond being, and he also teaches us how that good acts, especially in the symposium. Um, and the way that the good that uh, the good that is beyond being can act um, winds up being uh, something which would justify teleology, right? Okay. Now, does it have to justify a natural so teleology as opposed to a human teleology? Unclear, but it certainly lets you think teleologically. Right, right. And then what gets added to that idea is this notion of an appropriate measure, where in a sense, you could say, yes. that's a way of fleshing out what is, what is it to act for, for a good or, yes. um, so I guess yes. the idea is, there's a tendency Absolutely. to to things to kind of come to their appropriate, which I guess is a very Greek way of, of thinking, right, that things come to a kind of appropriate harmony, and, just and out it's... of themselves. And it's uh, it's particularly even among the Greeks because the Greeks, you know, we're all over the, all over the map on this one. But he, it, it's very much what Plato is and and Socrates are about. Um, and to give you a later example, right? When when uh, when when Galileo wants to decide that uh, the uh, Copernican way of understanding the movement of the spheres has to be right because it's more appropriate that it worked that way because it's more beautiful. Mm -hmm. He's thinking in exactly this manner, right? right? right. Um, and so, and I guess part of the the thought also is this appropriateness is something things have in themselves. You know, it's not like um, you know it doesn't. It's not something that happens in let's say con the context with all other things in a kind of mutual uh, right. so, you know relationship. But it's so, actually so, like a like the essence of things. Right. So so so. Uh... Basically, right. The 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 the, the Platonists uh, are very much objective good people here. The, the, this is not something where it's a uh, a relative or relational thing, and it certainly isn't anything put there by human purposes and minds, right? It's uh, uh, hu hu human human minds can be can be in conformity with the natural purposes and things, or at or at war with them, and so much the worse for the ones that are at war with them, right? There it. Uh, uh, the appropriate governing of human conduct is coming into accordance with the good that is already there, not prescribing what shall be. Right? The, 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 sta the standards of good are already in the nature of reality itself. And in the nature of the conceptual reality itself, not even the nature of the actual, you know, historical, in time, things around you. In the ideal realm. Which will also be how you know he thinks about political action as you know the actuality of, of all of our politics is crap but uh, my ideal uh, standard is the thing which determines whether or not i think there's anything worth acting on in sicily right kind of thing but th th the point is he's, he's an idealist in the naive sense of idealist as well right the the, the abstract standard is setting uh it's already there it's understandable intellectually and it's setting the standard uh for teleologically understood action right so all, all of that yeah all of that is there in in plato 
Um, uh, when you get to the Neoplatonists, they're going to go that go farther with all that because this whole metaphysical structure of the world will matter to them in terms of what counts as correct action, um, which we'll get to. But uh, okay, I think we've adequately covered what good being beyond being means before we get to the Neoplatonists, right? Then we get to Plotinus. This is where Joe, you started having trouble. So I first have to ask um, of the people here. How many people had read any Plotinus before this, or even about Plotinus before this? Jim, that's like no, okay. Um, so, uh, do we need do we need a, a quick background on Plotinus? If it would help. Okay, uh, Jim. I can't tell if Jim is on mute. Jim yeah, sure. I, I, I loved it. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, Plot Plotinus is a. Uh, uh, Greek philosopher, uh, Neoplatonist, you know, like second century. Uh, he's, you know, way after uh, uh, Plato and Aristotle, right? Um, uh, he's in a time when Christianity is already spreading, but has, hasn't become general. Um, and he's uh, uh, following in the footsteps of Plato, trying to put together things which are in Plato, Parmenides, uh, the Pythagoreans. Um, and he makes a whole systematic uh, philosophy that includes a whole systematic sort of cosmogony of how the uh, whole hierarchy of the world, metaphysical and otherwise, you know, originates from the one, right? Um, and this is a, uh, in his in his own understanding, primarily a, a philosophy and a metaphysics specifically. Um, it is secondarily uh, uh, somewhat religious. He's a pious man, right? Um, with a piety, which is not pagan in any sense of the actual pagan gods, but is very much of a piece of the kind of piety you get in the Stella um, uh, and, and, and other uh, philosophical uh, uh, groups of that part of the Hellenic world, so to speak. Uh, he influences a bunch of other Christian theologians in his day, um, especially uh, Oregon, first off, um, and uh, later his Neoplatonic philosophy is made much of by uh, especially the Eastern Church Fathers, that is the Orthodox as opposed to the Latin West. Um, uh, that is what later becomes Orthodox as opposed to what later becomes Catholic um, uh, in Christianity. But uh, that's sort of Plotinus, right? Uh, and uh, main work is the Aeneids, um, uh, it's Aeneads, whatever. Uh, uh, it's a, Nice, big, thick philosophical book. It's perfectly readable. You should, you should try it sometime. Um, it's, there are parts of it which are uh, harder to comprehend than others. Uh, you will always be asking yourself, how does he know that? right? Um, but uh, if you just uh, go with it and let him lay out the whole thing that he thinks that he knows first, as opposed to asking the epistemological, how does he know that kind of questions, you will you know, get a sense of the whole systems or schema he's, he's laying out. Um, in the schema he's laying out, uh, the one is first and uh, is equivalent to the good. It's an equal sign between them, but he thinks of it more as the one than as of the good. And being comes after it. Um, being and mind come after it equally. Uh, being, uh, so, so, so one equals good, first, first notion. And then below it, you get being and mind, uh, mind as news uh, or intellectual principle, sometimes translated, um, uh, as the subject and object of each other, so to speak. Um, the, 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 the mind thinking of what is, is, uh, is thinking of being. The, the being mind pair are also simply the truth. So you have a one good beyond being, then you have a being and, a, a, and, and divine mind that understands it. And those two together, the unity of those two together is truth. And that bit at the top is the beginning of the sort of metaphysical everything. Um, and underneath it, everything like soul and the world and whatever else are thought of as descending in various emanations from that. That little bit at the top is the, 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 uh, the pre-Christian uh, version of a philosophical trinity. And a lot of the Eastern Orthodox understanding of the Trinity wind up 
spinning around that one. So uh, they'll they'll try to map the Trinity onto this uh, onto these conceptual areas. Um, okay, but the point is that you've you've got a a kind of uh, tri triad of notions at the top of the uh, uh, at the top of the metaphysical stack. Um, in a entirely Greek, not yet uh, uh, Christian or in any way uh, monotheism in any of the traditional monotheisms religions, but that is a kind of religious thought or a theological thought, whatever else it is. Okay. One of the reasons it matters to know that this occurs philosophically is because lots and lots of later thought thinks a whole bunch of those things are particular to Christianity when they're just obviously not. Right. Um, you you cannot say that something is historically purely a result of Christianity if it's already there in Plotinus, because he's not Christian yet. Um, you cannot say there's no way you would arrive at that idea unless you were influenced by the monotheism of the Old Testament if it's already there in Plotinus, because he isn't. Not in the sense of following them anyway. Um, there's another thing which you find. Gilson trying to do in the second half of this chapter, which is different, which is he's trying to read this Neoplatonism out of Christian theology. He's trying to say that Christian theology is a uh, is a uh, uh, theology of being being the highest concept, not of there being a concept that's beyond being. And so anything which is Neoplatonic isn't Christian in that sense. This won't work either. It won't work because um, the uh, uh, not only is this stuff already there in Plotinus, it's also there in the Eastern Church Fathers a thousand years before Aquinas, let alone uh, 2,000 years before Gilson and his, and his uh, weak objections to it. So he'll, 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 he'll say things in the latter part of this chapter like, you could not possibly still you know, uh, think as a Christian and be a Neoplatonist in this sense. And then he quotes you all the people who are doing exactly that. Right? <laughs> um, so uh, uh, here we have to be a little bit Aristotelian on them and say actual proofs possible, right? We've got you know acres of uh, history of um, uh, Christian theology and Christian metaphysics that are heavily indebted to Neoplatonism of this Plotinian Plot Plot variety, and to claim that there's any fundamental incompatibility between them belies the history, right? Uh, not only were they uh, viewed as compatible and uh, acting as compatible for, for literally centuries, they dominate the entire theological history of what becomes the Greek Orthodox world. Right? There's tons of Platonism in the Christian West coming from Augustine, as opposed to these uh, uh, Eastern, uh, more Eastern uh, Greek influences. And the usual dividing line is, you know, where they speak Greek versus where they speak Latin, right? And Augustine is the, the the Latin who's writing in Latin, but who knows his Greek well enough that he's still a Platonist, right? He's not quite a full Plotinian Neoplatonist, but he's closer to being a Plotinian Neoplatonist than he is to being a Aquinian because, you know, he's certainly not following Aristotle. But uh, th the point is that uh, uh, while while the West moves in directions which, by the higher Middle Ages, move from the Platonism of an Augustine or an Anselm to the Aristotelianism of a of a um, of an Aquinas that happens very late, right? It's happening in the High Middle Ages, and for uh, a thousand or almost a thousand years, even in the West, at least for five hundred years in, in the West, uh, Christian theology is mostly Platonic, and it is to this day in the East, right? Um, and, and not only in the East is it still Platonic, it's Neoplatonic. <laughs> um, so uh, the thing that you, you find Gilson trying to do in the second half of this chapter, which is claim that all of the all of the Neoplatonic thinkers in the history of uh, uh, Christian theology are um, not really Christian because they're just following Aquinas, they're just following Aristotle. Um, this isn't going to fly because he has to leave out the entire East to make it seem plausible. Um, Okay. I had a quick question. Go, oh, James. Yeah. Do, do you do you think possibly part of it was, and I don't know because I'm not sure where he was historically, 
Uh, he, he mentioned something about having a disdain for any mention of mysticism. And I don't mean he said that outrightly. He just said, you know, Platonism leads to mysticism, which the connotation was it was not a good thing. And then he goes on and builds his case. You think it was partly because uh, he had equated mysticism or the church had been talking about the history of the Gnostics trying to influence early theology and that that was a bad thing? Do you think part so, of the reason he so, was so, so viewing... We, we, we clear out we clear yeah. the mysticism angle. First of all, um, Gilson is not as down on mysticism as you might think. He mentions both mysticism and moralism as things which can partly cure uh, someone if they're uh, uh, suffering from skepticism. Um, but uh, uh, he does think that mysticism <laughs> doesn't belong... He does think that mysticism doesn't belong in philosophy, right? Um, he, he doesn't like mystical philosophy. He wants his philosophy to be uh, clear and realist and not mystical. Um, but he thinks that, you know, uh, as, a, as, as, a, as a moral practice or as, or as uh, religion, mysticism might have something to be said for it, right? But that aside, that's just Gilson uh, uh, having his own, his own take on, on how he thinks about mysticism. Um, the, uh, there is a degree of uh, some of this, especially the Latin West, which is about rejecting Gnostic heresies. Um, and there were lots of heresies running around, some of them Gnostic, some of them not. Um, the, uh, and there's no question that, uh, Gilson is here following some of the, uh, hierarchy decisions, if I can put it that way. He wants to stay in conformity with whatever the, uh, Catholic church at this or that time declared was or was not orthodox or heretical, right? Gilson personally is trying to be a Thomist in that sense. And he's trying to stay in the good graces of whatever, even the early 20th century church, right? Thought of as, uh, orthodox in a very, at a very particular time in its history. Um, where he thinks, you know, neo-Thomism was, was the accepted thing. Um, and that means that, you know, if there's some, if he's looking back at someone like an Oregon or a, or a Scottus uh, Eregina, he will care a lot if they were ever condemned by the hierarchy, right? Where by the hierarchy, he'll mean the Latin West hierarchy, the papacy, right? The fact that those things are still accepted in the, uh, uh, in the Greek Orthodox world, you know, won't trouble him at all. He won't even notice. The Greek Orthodox Church basically doesn't exist for him. Um, but uh, uh, the places where this actually comes up in, in matters of controversy over the um, Neoplatonists in particular is especially um, uh, trin discuss difficulties about the Trinity and fights against Arianism and all that kind of stuff, which happened later than most of the Gnostic fights. Um, it's late Hellenic era before the fall of Rome, when Eastern Rome is going fine and Western Rome is in difficulty, um, that you get the, 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 the kind of sharpest fights about it. And that's mostly later than the, than the Gnostic stuff. Um, were there Gnostics who also made much of Neoplatonism? Mostly no, because mostly they didn't know it. But if they had, they would have loved it, probably. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm just saying that it was, it was more learned than most of the Gnostics are. Um, and it was more of a mainstream thing. The Gnostics were kind of a fringe thing compared to the church fathers, whereas Neoplatonism was a very much not a fringe thing among the church fathers. It was a accepted thing inside the fold. Um, okay. But uh, fair, fair, fair question. Uh, uh, there's more that can be said about this. That the, the, there are some arguments that um, Gilson himself gives for trying to read Neoplatonism out of anything uh, Christian in the second half of this chapter, which are almost laughably weak. Right. So the the, the, the two the two biggest ones he says uh, a, uh, a Christian a Christian uh, theology has to be a being theology. It can't be a good theology or a one theology, because there is no good theology in Exodus, basically. Um, you know, he's going to say that you know, in, in Exodus you get uh, 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 um, uh, uh, I am is who sent me or something like that, right? So there, there is a there is a uh, uh, the claim the claim that the uh, that the scriptures themselves say the being theology at the time of Exodus. How weak is this argument? Well, 
Um, it's a very weak argument because you also won't find a single word in Exodus about, you know, uh, the Son or the Holy Ghost or any of these other things which are specifically Christian, <laughs> right? Not a lick of it. Um, so uh, uh, you might as well you might as well say that because I don't find the, the the Trinity in Exodus, there's no Trinity. Right? It, it it proves way too much. It would it would reduce you to having to r remain in Orthodox uh, uh, in, in Orthodox Judaism, right? Um, there's a there's another one of these which comes on um, uh, later where he says um, there's almost a stark contradiction here because they're claiming at the one hand that uh, this thing deserves to be called God and on the other hand that it's a creature. How can any Christian say this? He says. He says that like I'm like in one page. Um, uh, and it's like, he, I, I don't know how, how, how that uh, appears to anyone else's ears, but um, uh, to me, it just sounds like he can't hear himself speak, right? The, 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 the distinguishing mark of uh, Christianity as opposed to Judaism uh, has to be something like an incarnation, which has to be something like the idea that something that can count as created uh, can also count as God. So if you think there's a flat contradiction in saying that something is created and, and something is God, you're not being Christian. You're being the opposite of Christian. <laughs> but that's an outsider speaking. So you can you can take your own your own view on that. Uh, yeah, I was saying it sounds like he's not uh, not as familiar with progressive revelation or that <laughs> idea because that well, he, he, seriously he, that's a big on, thing in Christian on, on, theology. On, on thirty three, on page thirty three, he does talk about these. Right, he he says. Um, uh, he says, all we can do here is recommend uh, Victorinius, who is one of these Neoplatonists, to the indulgence of modern theologians, right? Um, uh, da -da -da. And then he says, um, this time we could recommend Victor uh, uh, Victorinius to the indulgence of modern exegetes, right? So the, and then he says, the fact that Neoplatonism makes bad theology and works exegetes is no philosophical argument against Platonic notion of being. So the, uh, What's going on there? What's going on there is uh, he, he's got like flip dismissals of uh, uh, this early Neoplatonist Christian, right? Which are, whether he knows it or not, dismissals not of that Neoplatonist, but of Christianity. And he, uh, he, um, Gilson is unaware of it. Um, but anyway, that, that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps belaboring this point too much, but the, 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 the fundamental point to make here is that the arguments that Gilson tries to advance in the second half of this chapter for why Neoplatonism cannot possibly be a Christian the, uh, 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 philosophy are hopelessly weak, right, on any, by any objective standard, right? Um, and that's fine. He, he, he himself is going to come out in an Aquinian place for entirely different reasons and mostly philosophical reasons. I'm just saying that you cannot take seriously his claim to have shown that Neoplatonism, uh, that Christian Neoplatonism didn't exist, even though it was it was a thing for a, a thousand years before Aquinas. Um, okay. So. Uh, a question about uh, yes. what a Christian Platonism might look like. So, um, I guess my impression of maybe let's say Augustine is that uh, he very much accepts this framework of the one beyond being. This is identified with God the Father. And then it seems like God the Son would be something like being. So the logos and being yes. perhaps would be would be brought together. This, this, this is the way uh, the Victorianius that uh, Gilson is uh, railing, railing against uh, deals with it. It's also the way Oregon deals with it, right? Uh, for, 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 for them, the, 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 the entity that in Plotinus is below the one is the divine mind and being. And the divine mind, they just equate with logos. The divine mind, logos, and, and the second person of the Trinity and the son of the father, they just put a straight equal sign between those things. That's what Oregon does. Mm -hmm. And then for the Holy Spirit, they put uh, not, they don't equate that with being, they say the the mind being equivalence thing as the truth. That's what they equate. That truth is what they equate with the third person of the Trinity in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So so uh, one good and God the Father get equated. Um, uh, divine mind logos and Christ get equated, 
and uh, truth and Holy Spirit get equated. That's right. straight Oregon, and it's what you also find in the in the uh, in, in half of the Greek Church Fathers before they start worrying that they've made too much of a distinction between God the Father and and Jesus the Son, and they're worried that the Arians are going to ride roughshod into that and say that only God the Father is God. Right. right? And that's, I guess, is how the schism comes about later with the Western yes. world around the, uh, the procession of the Spirit and all of that, uh, the yes. Philly, Philly yes. Oak, Philly yes. Oak, right? something the, the, like that. The, right? the, the, the single iota of Philly Oak, yes. Um, Exactly. So, so the, the 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 they they get divergent Christologies over the issue of the relationship between uh, the logos and God the Father, and some of them want that to line up with the Plato good distinction. Sorry, with the one one good versus uh, divine mind Platonian understanding of these things. In other words, they want to remain consistent with Neoplatonism. And others say. I don't see a scriptural reason in the in, in, in the New Testament to require conformity to an idea out of Plotinus about how these things are related. And the only thing I feel I need to conform to is the in the beginning was the word uh, passage in John, right? So, and then beyond that, I, to reduce the uh, schism with the uh, with the Arians, I want to otherwise as much as possible insist that Jesus is fully God. So that's sort of the kind of thing that they fight about. Um, and some of them come out on that thinking that if you're appealing to Greek philosophy and any of that, you're being unchristian and you have to appeal to something which is distinctly Christian and not distinctly philosophic. Um, so that, that leads to you know, um, various finesses in what is accepted by the councils that will let the, uh, both sides of it um, think that they got what they needed so to speak. It's not decided in favor of one of those two parties. Language is decided upon that both those parties can see as agreement is in agreement with their position. It's a conciliatory solution. And it's certainly not one that reads out Neoplatonism from, uh, from uh, Christian canon, nothing like that. Um, now, it's fair to say that in the West <laughs> later, um, there was more of a schism about this, and there's especially an authority issue about it. Um, there's a Besides all the actual doctrinal controversies, there's a giant authority fight between councils in the East versus popes in the West. Um, but take us too far afield to go into all the history. But yes, mm -hmm. the, these these issues of understanding of the Trinity and especially related both of those things to the Arian heresy is the is the thing that that fight winds up being about. Uh, the other thing to understand about Augustine and all this is that um, he comes from a background that was taught by those Neoplatonists. Um, he himself is a Platonist more than he's a Neoplatonist. Um, but he was also concerned with uh, uh, especially refuting the Manichaean rather than the Arian heresy. Um, OK, so there's, there, there's, there's lots of stuff going on in all the different fathers about all this. But the, the, the fundamental uh, point I want to make, independent of you know the different positions, is uh, a very elaborate Neoplat Neoplatonic metaphysics was set out even before it got imbibed by Eastern Christianity. And then it lined up very well with Eastern Christianity and was made the basis of a whole Trinity doctrine in the Eastern Church. And one or another form of Platonism, either that one or a different one that was either informed by Augustine particularly or by the what I'd call the, the good theology of St. Anselm, was the dominant theology in the West down to the time of Aquinas. And none of them were Aristotelian in the West. Uh, none of them were Aristotelian in the East uh, down to the time of Aquinas. OK, so we, uh, we only get a, uh, a revision of the either Platonism or Neoplatonism of most Christian theology very late in the high Middle Ages. Um, but it is fair to say that the, that the Platonism that was uh, dominant in the West was not as Plotnian Neoplatonist as you get in the East. What you get in the West is parts Augustine, parts Anselm. And Anselm is a good theology out of Plato that is not entirely, how to put it, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not as uh, um, 
dependent upon the Plotnian additions to Plato as the Eastern one is. Okay. But all, all, all of this is just theological background so that we can understand what Gilson is on about in the second half of this chapter um, and, and can see you know, where, where you can trust him and where you have to worry as he's playing fast and loose with the history because he has his own, he has his own philosophical and, theo and theological axis to grind. He wants, he wants the story to come out that uh, Aquinas has the right answer to these questions. And on the philosophical qu questions, right, that's where he's, his reasons for wanting to come out on the Aquinian side are fundamentally philosophic. But he also has um, reasons for wanting to reject some of these other philosophies which are not philosophic, which are theological. Um, okay. Uh, okay, I hope that helped. So let's go through the list of all the people after Plotinus, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a, whole, a whole series of these. Oh, we could probably come back to the uh, Timaeus in a second, but um, there's there's a whole um, right. He goes through uh, uh, John John the Scot. That's uh, Scotus uh, Regina, um, who's a uh, like 800s uh, uh, Irish monk living in France, and he's reading all of the. Uh, He's not only reading, he's translating all of the uh, Greek fathers into Latin for the, uh, for the uh, uh, Frankish monarchies, right? So uh, they, they want to know what, uh, um, uh, what Gregory of Nyssa thought about X, right? And so they need someone to translate it from the Greek to the, to the Latin because nobody in the West knows Greek anymore. But uh, uh, John Scott does, and he, you know, reads them in the original, and he translates them into Latin, and you know, etc. He is, and he is a complete Neoplatonist. This is eighth century Latin West, in the middle of the uh, um, the French monarchy, um, uh, and he is indebted to the earlier um, Eastern. Church fathers for some of that. People like uh, Dionysius the Areopagate, who is otherwise known as Pseudo Dionysus, um, uh, who was a, um, a as well as uh, Victor Victorinus. Victorinus, uh, he's mentioning not because he's important, but primarily because he was a teacher of Augustine, and just managed to show that that tradition was the immediate predecessor of Augustine. When I say teacher of Augustine, I mean literally his his professor, right? Uh, the person who he studied philosophy with. Um, uh, and then, uh, uh, what do we get with Dionysus? What we get with Dionysus is this, uh, uh, it's usually called the negative theology. It's the, uh, uh, the, the, the claims of all the things you can't know about God. Um, it's often called the negative theology. Um, but the schema that you get in Dionysus is that you not only have the one, uh, you, have, you have the one beyond being, um, and there may even be a, a nothing beyond the one um, that is a more appropriate name for, uh, 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 for the highest even than one is. He writes a, a famous thing about the, you know, on the 99 names of God or something like that. Um, and uh, the conclusion of it is that the, of all the different uh, names of God, the one that is least misleading is nothing. Um, with, and for which the fundamental reason is that our, our ordinary concepts don't apply to it, something like that. Um, but that, that you get this whole, um, they're, they're, what I'm trying to say is that they're, even after they've gone inside of Christian theology, the Neoplatonic tradition, tradition is not only continuing, it's going even farther into the metaphysical stratosphere than Plotinus was, right? Um, with uh, more and more speculative towers of trying to explain the uh, origin of the world from a first principle um, by uh, logical decomposition and deduction. Um, okay. Uh, uh, and then the other, the other one he gives uh, later, uh, compared to that, by the way, uh, uh, Scotus, uh, John Scotus is um, uh, considerably more rational, if I can put it that way. Um, uh, and then uh, the last one he ends the chapter on is, is Eckhart, uh, Meister Eckhart, who is high middle ages, um, uh, even, even later than, uh, uh, Aquinas, 
Um, and uh, he is usually thought of as fundamentally Christian mystic. The 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 uh, God notion that you find in Eckhart is not Neoplatonic one, although he will allude to it at times, but it's that he, he wants to equate uh, God with truth. So uh, God is truth is the fundamental equation that he's starting from, and he's going to read off all the things that other people would find in a in a logos or anything like that, uh, or in being, from from that relationship. So he, he's a he, he's a mystic rather than a logician, but his his uh, all of his deductions will be from a starting with a triple equal sign between God and truth, and then he's going to understand that truth in a very Platonic slash Neoplatonic way. In some ways, this makes him more down to earth than the Dionysius uh, uh, of the world kind of people, uh, because he uh, he's basically stopping the hierarchy ascent at the point where uh, things are still completely intelligible, if I can put it that way. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and and uh, Eckhart was influential in the Reformation period to some degree, um, especially on some of the. Uh, quietest sex in, in Germany. Um, okay, but that's... Uh, general point here. There's, there's, there is a rich tradition of the Neoplatonic understanding of being. It's continuing long after uh, um, Plato and Plotinus. And uh, uh, Gilson is correctly characterizing all of them as equating being with essence and as dealing with these towers of metaphysical abstractions and uh, trying to understand the world from first principles by a kind of math-like reasoning, which isn't about numbers, but is about you know the, the, the logical constituents of, it, of what is required for something to, to be or exist. Um, and that is what passes for speculative metaphysics for easily a thousand years from 200 AD to 1200 AD, roughly. Um, okay, all of this completely parallel to and separate from any Aristotelian traditions that we'll also be discussing. Um, questions about any of that, first the history and second, what, what the notion of being is in this group. Hmm. So I'm wondering about uh, Mr. Eckhart um, and this identification of God with truth. Yes. Is that a way of saying? Um, so, because we were t when we were talking about the Eastern uh, Eastern theology, their truth, um, I think, was identified with the third person of the Trinity. Right. Yes. yes. Uh, with being and uh, divine mind, kind of the match between them. Yes. Um, is, the, is, is, so is, is Eckhart running with that sense of truth? Or is he just using the word to refer to something like the one or the good? He's not using it just to refer to the one or the good. He is using it in kind of the, the, uh, uh, the, the Neoplatonic traditional way. Um, but he's not simply talking about it inside that tradition, right? He's not locating his truth in that tradition in order to delimit its importance. For him, truth is a full name of God. Um, and uh, he can see a correspondence of all of the traditional persons of the Trinity with that truth. Um, right. So it's not simply being identified with the third person, but also with the triune are all truth. But the, uh, the, the characteristic method you find in Eckhart is he'll, he'll tell you that uh, we just have to think of this from the standpoint of the divine mind. What are these ideas in the divine mind? That's what it is. The, the, you get a very straightforward, if I can put it that way, um, for something so uh, f far afield these days, uh, um, uh, a, a, a theistic idealism. The beings are the thoughts of God. And that the thoughts of God are truths, right? The truths that are, are the thoughts of God's, and that's uh, to, to, to be, to be true, to be a thought of God, are equivalent. 
right? I had heard that that's the way the Muslim uh, Muslims do think about it. That um, we will get uh, to. We will get to some of the notions that you get, especially among the uh, uh, Muslim uh, philosophers, especially Avicenna, in like uh, some of the later chapters. Avicenna will come quite a bit, and Averroes as well. Um, but uh, the the, the um, thoughts of God uh, uh, idealism is actually um, considerably older and more Eastern than that. It's a it's a traditional Indian idea. Um, you get it in Indian metaphysics from like 6th century BC, um, and uh, you do find some echoes of that in especially some of the mystics in the Muslim tradition. Um, I'm thinking especially of some of the um, uh, Sufis of what would be uh, Eastern Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan these days area, um, who are in part um, syncretically putting together the theology they're getting from Islam and the uh, and the background metaphysics that they already had from their from their um, pre -monothe monotheistic traditions, right? Okay, but um, how do you how do you how do you hit a thought for God with a hammer? How do you what? How do you hit a how do you hit a thought from God with a hammer? Right. So uh, the the answer is that the hammer with which the the uh, uh, the anything else is hit is also itself a thought of God. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Isn't but, that a circle or a mountain bailey? It defense? is. It is. It is. It is a. It is a consistent system, is what it is, right? So, uh, yes, there, there, there's no question that this is none of this is a something you're proving from experience. This is a uh, an attempt to be a consistent explanation uh, that, that you can fit everything into. It, but the the uh, so, some of the more radical of the uh, Asherite theologians in Islam will go so far as to say that the the characteristics of the beings are only the habits of God. They will they will debate whether or not things have natures because if things have natures it might derogate from the omnipotence of God because he might be constrained mm -hmm. to have them only act according to their natures, um, and that will be a giant fight between Averroes and the theologians where Averroes will say, you're, you're you're being silly if you're saying that things have natures is a derogation from the omnipotence of God. Uh, he, he he made their natures and uh, uh, the, the, the the natures are 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 what things are and how they act. Um, but the theologians will say, wait, you're still saying that this thing necessarily follows without God's will if, if this uh, condition is there. The fire has to burn. It doesn't have any choice in the matter. And that's, you know, uh, not that's removing agency from God. So th they, in, in Islam, they will have those sorts of fights between the philosophers and the theologians. Right. But uh, 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 that's sort of their version of the Aristotelians fighting the theologians. Um, but uh, not, none of that is directly related to this. Uh, uh, the thoughts of gods are the beings idealism. That's a that's a, a a a mystical trope, if I can put it that way, that you get in lots of different cultures, even earlier than any of this history. It's there in Eckhart. You can find some echoes of it in Plotinus to a degree, but you already find it in you know, as I said, sixth century, sixth uh, century BC India, right? Um, or, uh, you know, so, so it, it's not an idea that had to be imported from somewhere else, right? It's a, it's an, it's a, an idea that, that springs up in different cultures because it's a, it's an obvious possibility for putting together a theism and an idealism as a, as a, as a complete philosophy. Um, I don't know if it's obvious is the right word for that idea, but, uh, it's, it's one of the older metaphysical ideas of mankind. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Um, uh, and I don't think Eckhart is simply, uh, Eckhart to do him justice is not simply echoing that, but that is where he comes out. A, a modern who comes out in a similar place would be someone like Bishop Barclay. Um, but, uh, anyway, the, 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 I don't know if that helps, but the, 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 uh, the attractiveness to Eckhart of the truth notion is that it gets by a bunch of these dogmatic assertion things that people aren't necessarily going to buy, right? He doesn't want people to have to accept an entire uh, Neoplatonic understanding of all of the metaphysical towers above things in order to uh, in order to agree with him on what he thinks is the essential part, which is the truth level. He thinks if you give him the God is truth level, he'll get everything else he needs. So to speak. Um, but that's that's Eckhart in particular. He's thinking of that as a kind of simplification. It's designed to be a kind of simplification. Um,
Okay. Um... Uh, this this is another case where uh, um, Gilson is trying to uh, break his lance for the idea that there has to be a being theology underneath everything, and you can't have one of these uh, uh, one theologies instead. Um, and uh, uh, Eckhart is asked how, how he will respond to this, and he says, um, Eckhart remarks, the evangelist has not said in the beginning was being, and God was being, but only in the beginning was the word. <laughs> Anyway, that's his, that's his, that's his uh, gloss. Go ahead. I was just going to ask about that, that part there, because the thought that the part that uh, what struck me as odd is that he conveniently left out that he's quoting Christ, right? Uh, I am the way, the truth and the life. Yes. And no one comes to the father, but through me. So you could say from a philosophical perspective, he isn't making one claim. It's a way which implies a direction or I guess you could say motion. And then the truth, which would be the part he quoted, and then left out the life. So that could, in, you could say, you could from an Eastern perspective, that would be almost like um, the spirit. Yes, he also he and also immediately father. gives you. As I say, he immediately gives you a distinction as well. But uh, 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 to to through me, right? Um, yeah, it seems sure. like he cherry picked for his own purposes. Uh, of course, he left does. out the other. Of, of course, he does. <laughs> but but the, the the point the point of the passage is that. Uh, Gilson is doing his own cherry picking and, and Eckhart is saying, I can cherry pick right back. <laughs> Gilson is trying to say, unless you have an explanation for this uh, uh, passage in Exodus, uh, uh, you cannot possibly claim this. And Eckhart says, I have this passage in John. I can claim anything I like. <laughs> they're, they're, they're both thinly, thinly throwing single darts of scripture at each other and their philosophies are these giant armadas behind it all, right? But the the the, the they're they're not getting the entire armada from, from from the scripture. They have the armada already, but the but the the single dart of scripture does not manage to sink either battleship. Is the point I'm making. <laughs> so I guess the motivation, Gilson's motivation for this, being a, a Aristotelian Thomist, uh, and I guess this is coming in chapter two, is to deny that there is anything beyond being. Basically, to um, to regard being as the ultimate principle. He does want being to be the highest principle and he does think that that is uh, 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 the appropriate Christian theology, so to speak, as opposed to, as well as the appropriate philosophical metaphysics. Um, he's, we're not gonna get to it in chapter two because it's way later, because uh, he's not gonna get it just from mm -hmm. Aristotle. He has to go all the way f fast forward to Aquinas. Um, but uh, uh, Gilson first, not first, G Gilson does want to establish that a being theology is to his mind, his way of thinking, uh, more Christian than a one theology, put it that way, um, a one theology or a good theology. Um, and part of the reasons he wants to do that is because um, uh, the characteristic difference that marks Thomism from the other philosophies around it is its doctrine of existence, right? And uh, uh, the not just its doctrine of existence for theology, but especially its doctrine of existence for particular things, right? The purely philosophical doctrines in, in Thomism about, uh, about the existence of individual particular things is what's characteristic, it's what, not characteristic, it's what distinguishes uh, Aquinas among all of the other scholastics before and after him. It doesn't just distinguish him from Platonists. It also distinguishes him from people like Don Scotus and, uh, and, 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 and others before and around him from the, from the uh, Averroese uh, 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 version of Aristotelians and from the, um, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, uh, thinking of the uh, uh, later Jesuit philosopher taught, uh, uh, taught Descartes, what I'm thinking of. Um, where is it? Yeah, my, my, my point is that the, um, uh, it is precisely on the question of existence and the existence of the particular things and whether or not the existence of things adds some things to their essence 
that is the characteristically Aquinian doctrine, right? It's what sets him apart among philosophers is his position on that. Um, there are plenty of other uh, uh, um, Christian theologies that are being theologies that he, that uh, Gilson could choose him, choose from, right? Uh, but uh, there aren't that many that are going to take the Aquinian position on existence. Um, I, I want to mention one other thing here on the on being one thing though that's necessary for understanding the um, uh, Aquinas. Um, this is on end of 36 and beginning of 37, where he talks about how these different people understand the Platonic ideas. Um, and the, the, the claim is, how do, so the question is, how do they understand the ideas, right? Um, uh, Plato's ideas must become uh, divine ideas if a Christian God is being so much so that rather than being in God, they are God, to quote only a few great names, St. Augustine, St. Anselm, St. Bonaventura, and St. Thomas Aquinas all agree on this fundamental point. So that's curious because it's very close to this Eckhart point, right? Uh, the, the, the Platonic ideas, our God is something which he's going to say is shared by all these other theologians, including the ones he likes. Augustine and Anselm and Bonaventura are all Platonists. Aquinas is not, right? But all four of them are, are going to agree on making a place for the Platonic ideas as divine ideas but they're not gonna be divine ideas that the divine mind has in any of them. They're gonna be divine ideas that the divine mind is in all four of them, is not has. And that's the difference between having a God that is a uh, uh, mysteriously active agent that might have mind-like characteristics and having a God that is more like the truth. And all four of those are coming out on the second of those outcomes. And Gilson is not disagreeing with them here. So that, that's a, one of the few striking things in chapter one where he, uh, uh, because Aquinas agrees with Bonaventura and Anselm on this point, he, Gilson, will you know give the Platonists one point, so to speak. <laughs> um, I can put it that way. Anyway, uh, I, have, I have no idea if that was so subtle it went by everybody. But does anyone see what I'm talking about with the difference between Platonic ideas being ideas that God has versus ideas that God is? Well, you know, difference between one who thinks, one who is thinking, or, you know, is an agent as opposed yes. to a thought. Uh, yeah, uh, is. Uh, you know, um, there's a way in which 36 all, and 37. This is uh, the big, top of 37. Top of 37. They've got that highlighted. Yeah. Right. So, so um, this is almost a litmus test of whether or not a philosopher is primarily a philosopher or primarily a. Uh, how to, put, how to put that, how to put it delicately, a superstitionist. Uh, and the point that's being admitted here is that uh, Aquinas is agreeing with the other, not the other, is agreeing with all three of the great uh, Platonists before him on this point. You could easily imagine someone having the being objection to the uh, Platonic theology that it makes God so... Uh, uh, abstract and logically necessary that there is no agency in God. There's no sign of that objection here. That's an objection you would find in an Asherite theologian, for example, or in St. Anne's, uh, not in uh, uh, William of Ockham. He would make an objection like that, right? But there's no sign of it here. That's not an objection that Gilson will raise or that Aquinas raised. Aquinas is perfectly happy with a God who is whose nature is uh, intelligibly enough known that uh, uh, it can, in some sense, be equated with Platonic ideas. It's that truth-like, if I can put it that way. Um, besides people like uh, uh, the Asherite theologians or uh, um, 
uh, Occam, you might also find any number of uh, modern you know, Protestants like uh, Lutherans that would disagree with that. They would find that I'm not way sure what an Asherite theologian is. I'm sorry. Uh, when I say Asherite theologian, I'm thinking especially of uh, predecessors of Al Ghazali and of the occasionalists that this was the sect in Islam that were all for the omnipotence of God not being constrained by any knowable uh, necessary nature relations, right? So. But you were talking about Christians, who, uh, some Christians who had that point of view. Yes, William of Ockham. I'm saying the Ashrite theologians would object to uh, 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 God being so truth-like that he lacked uh, willful agency, right? And right. so and so would William of Ockham, and so probably would Luther, and so on, right? Um, and uh, if someone wants to uh, uh, put an unpredictable willfulness into God, or else it's not godlike enough, um, that's a sign that they have a an animus against something like uh, rational philosophy that would extend to the point of uh, the reaction would be something like, don't you dare call God the truth. The God, God is freer than the truth. To call God the truth would be to constrain God to be you know, a, a, a known, no, known sta stable thing. That's not allowed. Right? There's, there's plenty of theologians in history that would have had that reaction and that did have that reaction. Um, but I'm just pointing out that uh, Aquinas isn't one of them, and neither is Gilson. Hmm. So I guess that's that A S H E R. A A S H A R I T E. I think there might be two I's in some of the spellings, like in Shia. Um, that's just how you transliterate from the Arabic. But uh, they, they were the, that was the dominant school of theology uh, before the time of Ghazali, right? Uh, and the one that was in controversy with people like uh, Avicenna and Averroes within Islam. Yeah, I'm sorry. You did, I, I didn't realize that you were not pronouncing it with the glottal stop in the middle. But that's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's the Islamic... I, uh, I, I right? don't know how okay, to pronounce that, a glottal stop. So. <laughs> but no, that... that that's not totally confusing me because I didn't know if this was people that were uh, skulking around Italy or, or Europe in the Middle Ages or uh, in the Middle East. Got it. They were in the East. Middle East. That's, Definitely in the Middle yeah, East. Yeah. They went. They went. Uh, they went east from Cairo, as it were. <laughs> east from Alexandria. East from the great universities and carried it off and yes. preserved it through the Dark Ages. Well, I mean, I would say that the, the, the first preservers were not the Asherites, it was the Metazolites. Um, yes, the, yes. Uh, those were the ones yeah, who basically really took, over, took over um, Eastern Orthodox theology and, uh, Greek, and Greek philosophy from yes. especially Nestorian Christians. Um, and mm -hmm. they uh, elaborated, you know, theologies of questions of predestination and free will and all that kind of stuff in very much the same vein that you would have gotten in, uh, in the, you know, um, uh, the, the Christian Near East of the, you know, fifth century or so, AD or so, um, they continued those discussions in Baghdad in, you know, in the 800s, right? And those were the people that translated all the Greeks into Arabic and, uh, and, and indirectly, therefore, led to the founding of the uh, Islamic um, philosophical tradition by people like Farabi, um, who read those Greeks in Arabic translation after that. Um, but uh, uh, that that school of theology, the more rational rationalizing theo uh, theology in Islam, was the Metazolites, and and the Ashrites were kind of a reaction against that. They were a conservative reaction against the Metazolites, um, who were seen as being. Um, uh, too given to imbibing foreign influences and Greek philosophy and uh, 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 given to heretical innovation and not uh, literalist and orthodox enough, right? Um, there were some later literalists who had similar objections even to the Asherites, but uh, at the time the Asherites were the reaction against uh, the Metazolites rationalism, put it that way. Okay, so um, we've come to the end of the chapter, but 
I want to give you guys a chance to ask all of your questions, but before that happens, I want to get a cup of coffee. So think about questions you want to ask, passages you've highlighted, uh, Jim, et cetera, and uh, I'm going to uh, pause for just a second to get a cup of coffee. Be right back. Shall we uh, wait for Jim or shall we get started? Everyone has to give a vote. Uh, I would I would say uh, go ahead and start. Uh, okay. I'm recording then. So, who wants to go first with questions? Well, I was the one that started off with the uh, uh, biggest puzzle, and. I realize now that uh, because I was uh, in such dismay after trying to comprehend some things I had on page 30, 32, 35, that I sort of probably read faster than I should have done up to page 41 to get to the next chapter to start yes. with Aristotle. At least this, you know, the existence thing this more it was easier because Gilson was more into his own home territory there. But yes. Anyway, uh, seems to me that, that, that going over as you have just done, the uh, second half of the chapter is a very important. And now that I can review a recording of it later, I think rereading it will be useful. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's a lot there and there's a, uh, a lot there that is just Gilson's take on these things. There's also a lot even that's- so, I was gonna say, there's also, a lot even, that's, there's also a lot that's buried in the sense that there's many complicated thinkers there that are just being given glancing blows, so to speak. And if you yeah, do, sure. so there's a, there's a lot of iceberg under the text, if I can put it that way. Um, Hello, I just was getting coffee too. Great. We've already started Hello. recording, so we're, <laughs> we're back. Okay, cool. Joe was just saying that he, uh, uh, Started reading too fast after about page 32 when it got hard, and uh, but he's going to enjoy going back over the uh, over the over the tape. Uh, Alex, you know we, we we record these things, and I I, I generally put the uh, the recording of the Zoom session up on YouTube and put a link to it um, below the meeting. So if people want to go back and review or come up with questions for next time, they they have a way of doing so. Um, so we'll do that again. Well, that's good to know. Um, and I think you guys just finished Heidegger. Is that right? We just finished um, reading um, uh, volumes three and four of Heidegger and Nietzsche. Okay. Um, and before that, we had done Being in Time the previous year. So uh, the Being in Time was partly to prepare that stuff on on the Heidegger and Nietzsche. Um, and coming out of that, there was you know uh, the open question of what did people think about all this uh, question of being stuff before Heidegger? Is he right that no one was thinking about it beforehand? And so I bring up Gilson in part to correct the impression that no one was thinking about the problem of being before Heidegger. They were thinking about it differently than he thinks about it. Um, and he can blame them for not thinking about it the way he was thinking about it, but they were definitely thinking about it. And so that's partly why we're doing this now is to get a sense of what sort of, what's the, uh, what's the backstory of the problem of being from a uh, from the point of view of the tradition. Um, right. I have a question about that actually. Uh, I guess in that direction, I have some background in Heidegger, mm -hmm. also. But uh, this has always been a big question mark, you know, uh, for me. Uh, what is this thing on to theology? And you know, there's so much. I think Heidegger himself was a medievalist, right? Or or studied, uh, trained in medieval philosophy. So. Um, uh, he, but uh, so it was interesting the way uh, you laid out the options, uh, Jason, earlier about. Um, so, you know, there is an onto theology, which might be would be something like an Aquinian theology. Then we have what could be called a oneness theology or also a goodness theology, mm -hmm. which would follow the platonic uh, platonic line. And so it seems like. With with Heidegger, what happens is we kind of go down below, as it were, and the essence, the uh, the emphasis is not on essence, as you get in Platonism, nor on a kind of balance of essence and existence, as I think Thomism strives for, but you get a privileging of existence, and you still have a notion of being, 
but um, somehow, you know, so I'm trying to understand kind of that. Yeah. It seems yeah. like there are That's three a, levels. It's a good, it's a good question. Sense. It's a good question. So, so, so um, for, first of all, the way that uh, Heidegger uses the term ontotheology, it would certainly also include the other theologies I'm talking about here, right? The the, the 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 one the one ontology the good ontology not ontology or the one theology the the good theology um, all, all of those would still be part of this same problematic of onto theology for Heidegger right he's not using the word onto theology to mean the theology that regards being and God as equivalent he's using onto theology as the um, it's the the whole uh, uh, set of thinking that is around um, thinking of the relation between being and the beings as being a theological question, as being a question about God. So thinking about being and the beings in uh, uh, as a theological question and uh, see, seeing, um, yeah, that, that's, that's the fundamental ontotheology thought. And, and the claim is that um, uh, there's something like a um, a tendency to objectify and reify being, to turn being into an object understood externally, and then to ascribe to it character, godlike character. In this, in in that earlier tradition, it's a, not only as a way of thinking about being, but uh, as a way of thinking about being, which is precisely not phenomenal. It's not looking at the evidence from experience in history of how being appears. It's instead trying to construct the math of how the world might work behind the curtains to see the phenomenal as a result of, or an appearance result uh, pr projected by that behind the stage reality, right? So in a sense, this is part of his critique of um, uh, insufficiently evidenced uh, uh, projected Platonisms behind the world, if you can put it that way. Um, he Heidegger wants there to be experiential evidence of these things. That's his phenomenal character, his phenomenological method character. Now, he gets famously abstract, uh, and so do the people he's dealing with, and they get very far from that pretty fast, but his eye is always still on the um, experiential evidence of these things. And that is, yes, his existential character. Um, he He's starting from not only uh, something as conceptual as material particulars occurring in time, he's starting from the interior of our conscious experience. Um, and he wants to know, he wants to understand uh, truth itself as something which we experience and undergo in time. So in that sense, he's way more down in time, down in actuality, down in history, than almost all of these thinkers, even Aristotle. Um, and for him, that's primarily a matter of trying to connect it to the evidence, right? The evidence meaning what we actually experience. And he's he's getting that uh, to a large degree from Husserl, from his you know from his his uh, the phenomenological tradition before him. Um, so so one defining feature then of uh, onto theology in this broader sense that Heidegger is using it is that being is in some sense seen as eternal, or as lying beyond uh, on the other side of time, whether it's in the Platonic sense of a one in a good beyond being or the Aristotelian sense where it's in a somehow closer to the world of actuality, but being is still eternal. It's the eternity of things. It's right. not so this, temporal. Right. And this, this, is, this is precisely uh, uh, Nietzsche's critique of Platonism, that it, is, it has uh, uh, looked for an, an eternal behind the world of becoming and frozen being as a result. Um, uh, and one of the reasons we're reading uh, Heidegger and Nietzsche is to see his take on that reaction to Plato and to Platonism, right? Um, 
which is not in, not entirely sympathetic. That is, there's lots of places where uh, Heidegger is going to disagree sharply with Nietzsche. Um, in the course of doing so, it's in the course of where he's explaining why Nietzsche reacts to Platonism in Western history as you know uh, uh, this you know advent of nihilism kind of thing um, that we come across Heidegger trying to explain uh, the notion of the beyond beingness of the good in Plato. And what's striking is that as soon as he has to explain that, he equates anything beyond being with the capital B being, and the thing that is beyond is the being of the beings. So his claim is that to the extent that one is thinking about the being of the beings in the plural, which from the point of view of the Parmenidians means once you're on the way of mortals, you're talking about the beings, not being too core. Um, the only thing beyond that is being. For Heidegger, being is something more like uh, uh, that which has a history here, the history of its unveiling of these different metaphysical traditions or something like that. Um, Heidegger for being has an it, it has or is an activity. It's not a static thing. Um, being has a history for Heidegger. Um, but uh, certainly for Nietzsche's Plato, if not for Plato himself, um, uh, uh, leave aside the good, which is beyond being, being itself is already something like uh, an enduring presence, which is uh, uh, unaffected by the category of time. And the unaffected by the category of time thing is actually for Plato, true not just of being, but of the intelligibles as such. The entire noumenal world is outside of time for Plato, not just being. Um, the entire world of mathematics is outside of time for Plato, right? And when when uh, when Nietzsche is criticizing Plato, he's criticizing him for uh, caring more about that uh, noumenal world outside of time and thus deprecating the world of becoming and history and passion um, in favor of a, a supposedly perfectly intelligible world of, uh, uh, of ideal and unchanging. Um, and that is to Nietzsche a, a falsification of experience, something like that. In that respect, Nietzsche is a Heraclitian. He's on the other side of the, the war of the Fluxus against the Manus. He's on the other side of the war between Heraclitus and, uh, and Parmenides. Okay, so all that's just sort of background of situating Nietzsche, the sort of Nietzsche-Plato fight. Um, Heidegger and all that is talking about being, being in a different sense, which he wants to be way more imminent. He doesn't want it to be an abstract idea that you're um, inferring about the nature of things from uh, by towers of abstraction and putting at a point of origin in a metaphysical chain from which you deduce the world. He wants it to be something which is much more um, a felt or understood thing in the experience of the revealing of truth, right? Um, truth happens to people. <laughs> um, and the, the, the different ways in which being has been revealed to people are the history of being, right? In that sense, Heidegger is way more in time. He's way more historicist a philosopher than any of the other people in this tradition, uh, with the possible exception of Nietzsche. Um, so, uh, and, and that's a lot of that is what we've, you know, just been going through in the previous, you know, uh, six to eight months, whatever. Um, Aristotle is closer here in the sense that compared to Plato, he is definitely moving in the direction of, he wants to know about the things which exist in time. He wants to know about the material particulars. He wants to know about the physics to Plato's mathematics. Um, but he is still not thinking about that at, in terms of the evidence of the interior of consciousness. Nothing remotely like it. He's, he's, not, he's not a modern in the uh, Cartesian to Nietzsche subjectivist tradition, right? Now, Heidegger has his own objections to how subjective that whole tradition, that whole modern tradition gets, but it kind of is where he starts from, right? Husserl is starting from that subjective tradition, but making the claim that 
the mind is always already plugged into the outside world. It's not just, you know, contained in the interior consciousness, right? So uh, Husserl is, is in a subjectivist tradition, but making a move which says um, the evidence, the subjective evidence tells us that we are always already in an external world, right? We're not simply locked in our heads, so to speak, as some of the other moderns might have thought. Um, so that, that's the place where Heidegger is kind of starting. Um, so from that point of view, he, he compared to any of these ancients, he's starting for way more subjectivist placed, way more of interior consciousness place, even though he's trying to use that evidence to get outside of the interior consciousness. Now Heidegger's uh, and his issue with Aristotelianism would be, even though Aristotle is interested in the particulars, in the things of, of, um, of our senses and so on, he is still after a science of them. And like I think you mentioned earlier, science is only of, science is not of that which is in time. Science is of universals. Um, right. And, and, and Heidegger, you know, he rejects the scientific, which I guess is also a, the Husserlian approach in, in many ways. So and he goes down this kind of poetic, aesthetic route. To, to some degree. Uh, I mean, so, so, so uh, Heidegger will, you know, uh, give science uh, a place in its due, but he is much more interested in existence, lived experience, etc. cetera, right? Uh, uh, science may usefully teach you any number of things about uh, 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 lasting truths which can help you manipulate the world. You know, he'll be entirely, uh, entirely in agreement with that. Um, and it also can, uh, you know, get you st uh, st stable truths and so forth. Um, but none of that's just measurement. Sorry. That motto outside the social science business at the building at Chicago. Science is measurement. He's not just saying measurement, right? The point, the point is there, there's a ways in which it is, uh, it teaches us truths and it's a guide to uh, a practice, right? And all of that beyond measurement when it's actual, when you're talking about it's actual conceptual knowledge. But the, the, the thing that that is always leaving out for Heidegger is the single lived experience nature of human life, right? <laughs> It's all very well to discover a, 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 a enduringly true mathematical theorem or a uh, useful for the next 50 years uh, scientific fact, um, but uh, you're dying. So uh, how are you going to live? Right? So th th there's always this, uh, this uh, direct, blunt, uh, in-timeness possibilities of action of the concrete, finite human being aspect to everything Heidegger is about, including these grand themes of history. Even these grand themes of history are about what you can think and do about them for Heidegger. Um, and, and in some ways, that's closer to people like um, Kierkegaard, and in some ways, even closer to elements of the mystical tradition uh, uh, than it is to um, any of these other philosophical schools. There's a similar em emphasis on uh, what it means for your practice, especially your moral practice, in some of these earlier theologians. Um, uh, anyway, that that th there's there's that practical personal aspect of, of Heidegger, if I can put it that way. Um, despite the fact that his actual philosophical productions is you know constantly just engaging in these very abstract discussions with these very ob obscure texts. <laughs> Um, in terms of his actual background, yes, he trained on uh, Aristotle and Aquinas um, and uh, knows a uh, decent amount about some of the other um, scholastics like Scotus, but especially Aquinas, and he knows Aristotle extremely well. Um, he knows Plato pretty well. Um, there are places where he has blind spots in Plato, and I think it's fair to say he understands Aristotle more than he understands Plato. But his uh, book on the sophist is quite good, for example, uh, which is some of those challenging things in this area for for Platonism. So he, he's not uh, he's not blind in these things, um, if we can put it that way. But I think it is fair to say that he he uh, will not or cannot <laughs> think outside the being as highest category scheme uh, from which he begins. Um, 
in terms of theologies uh, and and what they you know their, their their relation to different metaphysics, the the being one is probably the most common and oldest. Um, there's also ones which relate it to um, uh, one uh, that relate it to power, that relate it to will, um, uh, and to good. And the good is the one that's most distinctively platonic when it happens, right? If someone's not influenced by Plato, they're not going to go in the good direction. Um, and I don't mean that they're going to go in a bad direction. I mean, they're not going to uh, come up with a, a metaphysics or a theology in which the good is the central idea. Um, whereas you could easily find people that go in the one direction, even if they're not directly influenced by Plato, right? Both because that's an older idea in people like Parmenides, and also because it's closer to some of the other monotheisms, right? You find plenty of um, uh, Muslim philosophers for, for whom the oneness of God is the single most important thing about God, right? And they're actually distinguishing themselves from Christians in that regard, um, and not for not not for reasons which are directly tra traceable to Plotinus. Let's put it that way. Um, but uh, this was there was a whole there was a whole sect in medieval Spain that was the partisans of unity. Right, um, but uh, uh, the point is that there are there are one theologies, being theologies, power theologies outside of um, this particular Platonic tradition. Um, okay, good question. Uh, more, Alex, or um, I guess I'll pass for now, and okay. maybe later I can. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, Jim, I'm sure you've got passage highlighted that you want to ask me about. I do. <clears throat> um, we covered a lot of stuff about uh, middle and later about his squabbles with different theological positions. But in the beginning, being that I'm still, I think, in um, fallout, not want to say fallout, decompression from Heidegger overload. Yes. That I question every single term I read. Yes. So when we <laughs> beginning of the chapter, he starts speaking about, uh, in particular, on page two, uh, being is the first principle of human knowledge. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Nietzsche would say knowing is actually lesser than truth because it's trying to make things static that we can hold on to. Right. His definition of knowing would be to hold on to make it dead. And truth sure. is actually Okay, so when he's speaking about knowing, uh, I wanted to make sure that I, he isn't, he doesn't care what Nietzsche's definition would be, and I was going to make sure that I'm, I'm right about that as as I continue to read. And then secondly, I could actually breathe to say that I'm well within my philosophical rights to say I don't care what Heidegger thinks. Metaphysics still is going on. It isn't yes. over. So, so, it so, didn't so, end with nihilism. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so right. you're you're entirely right that metaphysics is still going on, and he's doing metaphysics here. There's no question. He's even saying that we should have to get back to doing metaphysics, or uh, or we'll get stuck in skepticism, right? Uh, uh, that's something Gilson is definitely saying here. Um, and uh, uh, when he says being is the first principle of human knowledge, and therefore the first principle of metaphysics, um, uh, Gilson is advancing that as his own proposition, right? It's the this is his own philosophy. It's not, you know, he's not uh, propounding someone else, right? Hmm. And the main thing, yeah. uh, the main reason he's doing that is not to, he wants to avoid the claim that metaphysics is impossible, right? There are lots of positivists running around in his day who are saying that metaphysics is impossible and everyone who tries to do metaphysics is screwing around with being fooled by grammar or some other thing like that, right? And and the claim that, you know, metaphysics is bunk, right? And, uh, uh what he Gilson is trying to say is um, uh, being is the first principle of human knowledge and the first principle of metaphysics. And uh, we can do metaphysics and all the repeated mistakes of past failed metaphysics are down to the mistakes those particular philosophers made and not to the impossibility of metaphysics. Right. Right. This is like 20 years post being in time, correct? Yeah. I mean, originally less than 20, 10. Okay. Ten years after oh, being in time. Okay. Okay. In a very different tradition, but yes, ten years back after being in time. Okay, I'm trying to also orient myself to the impact of being in time and the reaction right around that period. 
Uh, I mean, he, uh, it's fair to say that uh, uh, although Gilson is uh, heavily aware of all the things going on in philosophy, in cl especially continental philosophy, and he's certainly aware of the things going on in existentialism, and he'll bring up some of those things later, he is not, you know, an existentialist himself. He's not in that camp. He's trying to do philosophy in a much more traditional way, if I can put it that way. Um, uh, not even an academic way, in a way that's so traditional that it's uh, an outlier even within the academy in his day. Right? Huh. Much of the much of the kind of philosophy he he wants to do is being done in classics departments and theology departments and history departments. Right? Where people write their you know their history on this particular philosopher. Um, uh, so, very traditional philosophy. Okay. Yep. Good. Okay. Keep going. The next, the next, the next thing I was wondering about was we had started to touch on what he meant by substances, and you had actually brought up the uh, the the example of the color, and, yes. and I I did yes. some study on substance dualism, and I immediately went there with okay, so colors are properties, and substances can have properties you know, that's where my mind started to go with that. But I understand that we're not really going there. But I was wondering... By the time we're in the Aristotle chapter, we will be going there, right? In, in chapter two, we're going to oh, be... Upbeat. Oh, okay, great, great. Chapter two is going to be all about being in substance, and it's going to be all about okay. Aristotle. And the, the, the idea that substance is the putting together of a matter and a form that is a substrate of attributes which can be adequate, which can be accurately predicated of it, right? All that's traditional Aristotle. And that's what we're getting in chapter two. And then the question will right. be, um, in that whole Aristotelian doctrine of the, uh, of the being of the individual thing, right? where is its being? And the claim will be it's something like the being is at its substance, but which is the putting together of the matter and the form, but almost everything about it that makes it distinct as the thing that it is, is coming from the form. And okay. that being the case, Yes, there is this extra piece about the in time individuated, you know, uh, 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 instancing of the thing, so to speak, that it is this individual particular, right? And that will be made much of by later Aristotelians. But Gilson's point in chapter two is going to be for Aristotle himself, as opposed to later Aristotelians, he has moved towards putting the, the particulars into time. And he's created for us a whole doctrine of actualization, possible and actual, and the way in which things act. But he himself, Aristotle, is still thinking of the relations between these things as primarily the relationships between their conceptual forms, which is why he's thinking in logic. Okay. And that, and means, the... that means that, in a way, you've created a world where you completely deny Plato's theory of being, about which you can reason as though Plato's theory of being was true. Hmm. So you said Plato's theory of being is completely wrong and the, and the ideas are only abstractions. But when you want to know everything that something does, you look at its form and shape and reason about those forms and shapes logically and concatenate them the same way you would math problems. And that means you're treating them as though they were platonic ideas. Right. So, um, which is like a weird, <laughs> Gilson's going to treat that as kind of a weird halfway house between he agrees with Pl uh, Aristotle <laughs> on all those first parts where he's taking down Plato and he, and, but he wants it to go further. He wants him to say, and there's something special about these things being actual in time and material in particular, which is not hmm. there in just their abstract shapes and essences. Um, there's a, a wonderful line uh, later where uh, uh, um, uh, he's quoting some other philosopher who's saying, um, uh, I think it's Averroes, he says, Averroes is enough Aristotelian on this point, he says, that uh, um, someone tells him that there's no difference between this, uh, uh, this, possible, uh, this possible thing, which has exactly the same essence, and this material particular over here, right? And... Uh, uh, Gilson says that Averroes would say that this is very far from being a fact, right? Um, yeah. Meaning 
you're making an abstract claim about something which isn't actually real, which is a merely possible, where you're claiming that it would act the same way if it were, which it isn't, as this actual material thing over here, which actually is. And he says, that claim you just made is the farthest thing from being a fact of anything I I've ever encountered, right? The point is, he, uh, the, the Aristotelian, in, Aristotelian in him wants to say something like, only things that are actual, actually act. Reality is actual. And all your towers of abstractions aren't. Not aren't real, not aren't actual, aren't. Huh. Does he uh, also, when we get into the part about with Aristotle and substance, does he also get into the law of identity? Because I know that he started to kind of go there. Uh, um, not the law of identity. He, I mean, identity really came up in the first chapter, uh, the, the the one chapter, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because it, it, I mean, the one idea is almost the is almost the notion that the being of something is its identity, yes. right? Yes. Um, and uh, the place where it will become an issue for substance is the notion of instances, right? So Plato wants identity to be something like an equality sign between two forms, right? There's another notion of identity, which is more like the this one here. Of the 48 Nissan Sentras, this Nissan Sentra here. There's an identity in that sense, which is not just the concept, right? but yeah. which is uh, uh, a more ID'd version of identity in the sense that you have a, a, an index running over all the concepts saying copy one, copy two, copy three, copy four, copy five. And until you've added that it's copy five, right? You haven't actually identified it. So identity will get used in two ways. One is just identity in the sense of, can you put an equal sign between them because of the same idea or shape? And the other is are they actually the same identical thing? Whereby same Does identical thing. Does this relate thing, us back to the? Whereby same identical thing. I don't mean are they are they similar? I don't mean were they made the same way? I don't mean do they have the same nature? I don't mean do they have the same functions? I mean, are they literally the same? The morning star and the evening star. They're not similar. They're exactly the same star. Right. Uh, Venus. Go ahead. Does this relate to the idea that, um... oh, damn it. Sorry. I'll come Watch back. It. OK. The, the, there's going to be other people that will have other ways of dealing with that identity question. And some of them will try to make it, they will, they will um, elaborate their notion of essence or essentiality or conceptness enough that they can uh, get differentiation down to the level of identity without needing something like existence to do it, right? Um, this is the famous debate between Scotus and uh, Duns Scotus and, uh, and Aquinas. But, uh, and, and Gilson will take Aquinas aside in that. But it, the issue of how you, how you completely differentiate one particular from another is is an issue that's a an open issue here, right? Do you do it with just a concept, or is it something more than a concept? And so, in that sense, identity will still be a problem going forward. Identity, just in the sense of definition, has already been covered in the in the chapter one Platonism part. But identity, in the sense of specifically identifying this particular, as opposed to that it's a copy of this ideal table, right? That's still going to be an open question through the, all the later scholastics, where they're debating about it. Go, go Joe. Okay. Does that? How does this relate to the species versus uh, individual detail? Uh, you know, you talked about all the cars. Uh, you can talk about them down to the point of their VIN number. Yep. Uh, and, and the VIN. I think the VIN you, go ahead. The, the VIN number mm -hmm. is the, is the idea that there there's at least one characteristic that they all differ in that I can use to tell them apart, right? And, and that's like the, 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 the Duns Scotus version of uh, individuation is if you have all of the conceptual determinations of a thing, you have the thing itself, 
right? If I don't just give you a, a, a genus the thing falls into or a species that you know has in common with other things, but if I give you every determination of the thing, including where it is in time and how long it is and what it was, which molecules it was made out of and so forth, if I give you every determination of it, I give you the thing itself. There is no difference between the complete specification of the thing and the thing to Duns Scotus. To Aquinas, there still is a difference between those two things. The complete specification of the thing isn't the thing. The thing is something else. It is that complete specification actually performing the act of existence. Hmm. And that distinction is exactly what the two of them will differ on as to essence existence. Is a completely determined essence the thing? Duns Scotus will say yes, and Aquinas will say no. Great question. Next question, Jim. You still mulling that one? Um, <laughs> no, no, no. That's good. I, I just, I'm looking forward to getting into that. So yeah, sure. You know, we're going to answer the 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 part about substance and properties and all that and how that works in the Aristotelian uh, yep. way of thinking. Um, I also was wondering. As he gets, well, I was going to ask you your, a pers your personal opinion on something. Sure. Um, about just your own take on it. How, how do some, like, okay, see, in the Orthodox Church, don't have a problem with the Platonic metaphysics uh, yes. messing with their theology? Do you think that they can do that? Um, what's the word? honestly and defend it robustly yes and no, no and, and why why is there such a huge because i've already I, I know what you're saying the western aristotelian lens over uh christian theology tends to make um i think a lot of fundamentalism actually because sure. that's a lot of the fundamentalist uh western tradition i think the princeton theological seminar in reaction to the higher critics in the 19th century went out of their way to simplify and, and really took the Aristotelian thing to the next level. And, and but, some, some of them not even Aristotelian, some of them, you know, way more, way, way more uh, anti-philosophical even than that, if I can put it that way, right? Um, yeah. So th there, there's no question there's a lot of modern theology, which is uh, uh, against even, even, even the degree of philosophy, uh, uh, philosophical abstraction you get in Aristotelianism like uh, like uh, 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 Aquinas, right? And then there's mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely an even bigger one that would have an objection to the uh, degree of speculative metaphysics that you get in something like uh, Neoplatonism, right? Um, and some for purely philosophical reasons and many for other theological ones. But the answer to your direct question was, do the uh, Eastern Church Fathers manage to get their Neoplatonic theology to line up with their uh, Christian theology in a, in a way which is uh, honest and seems consistent to them, and the answer is absolutely. Um, it was a it was an entire it was an extremely elaborated um, system that worked fine for them for centuries, and to some degree still does, and the 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 places that people tried to introduce you know objections to it have all been addressed by, you know, intelligent people. So that doesn't mean that it's right. It does mean it's consistent. Right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Alex. Just want to say a quick uh, thanks. I got to get a head out, but uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to the next one. So thanks a lot. This was great. Yep. Great. Glad to have you and uh, hope to see you next time. Yeah, see you guys. OK, Bye. thanks. So I, I wanted to give you an example of this. Uh, so uh, uh, one of one of the uh, 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 one of the claims that he made was that you couldn't have the you couldn't not have the being theology because of the um, uh, because of the Exodus story, right? So the the, yeah. the, ex, the, the Exodus beingness. So uh, this is uh, Gregory of Nyssa. 
right? Who is one of the, those, one of the aforementioned Neoplatonic uh, Greek church fathers, right? Um, and he's writing <laughs> the, li the life of Moses. So it's going to come up, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what does he actually say, right? Just, let's just, let's just jump in there and read him. It's, 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 uh, it's in uh, three paragraphs where he gives his argument against the being theology. And he's going to almost come out and say, the people that are fine the be being theology, whether they know it or not, are Manichaeans. Okay. Hmm. So, um, okay. So, uh, uh, da, da, da. Um, uh, so, first of all, the, he's talking about the inaccessibility of being to knowledge, right? Um, uh, it is not in the nature of what is not life to be the cause of life. That's what Moses yearned for is satisfied with the very things which leave his desire unsatisfied. Okay. Just a second. <laughs> Sorry, it was family talking about dinner. Um, okay. Uh, so this is this is this is what uh, uh, Nissa thinks, or Gregory, whatever thinks. Uh, uh, Moses is learning in his uh, uh, face to face. He learns from what is said that the divine is by its very nature infinite, enclosed by no boundary. If the divine is perceived as though bounded by something, one must by all means consider along with that boundary what is beyond it. Or certainly what is bounded leaves off at some point, and it gives examples, air, et cetera, air, water, et cetera. Uh, yeah. The limits of the boundaries uh, which circumcise the, uh, the birds of the fish are, are Birds of the fish are obvious, the water is what limits what swims, and the air is what limits what flies. In the same way, God, if he is conceived as bounded, would necessarily be by, surrounded by something different in nature. It is only logical that what encompasses is much larger than what is contained. Now it is agreed that the divine is good in nature, but what is different in nature from the good is surely something other than the good. What is outside the good is perceived to be evil in nature, but it was shown that what encompasses much, is much larger than what is encompassed. It most certainly follows then that those who think God is bounded conclude that he is enclosed by evil. Since what is encompassed is certainly less than what encompasses, it would follow that the stronger prevails. Therefore, he who encloses the divine by any boundary makes out that the good is ruled over by its opposite. But that is out of the question. Therefore, no consideration will be given to anything enclosing infinite nature. It is not in the nature of what is unenclosed to be grasped. Every desire for the good is attracted to that ascent, constantly expands as one progresses or trusting onto the good. So the claim is that God is unknowable because God is infinite, and the attempt to make God into into a being is the attempt to make God finite, which will enclose God in evil and make uh, God only one of the two principles of the world and that the lesser. Hmm. Now, I'm not saying that argument is entirely convincing to everyone because it's definitely depending upon an image, but you have here uh, uh, an Eastern scholar, uh, 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 Eastern church father, directly dealing with uh, what is supposedly going on when uh, Moses is seeing God face to face. And he's claiming that his, you know, his whole gloss on the passage is that God cannot be comprehended by thought and is therefore beyond being. Hmm. No problem at all. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so let me throw in one quick left field one from that. Sure. Would 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 you place Maimonides 
and Leo Strauss in a Platonist camp if they were pressed? <laughs> or, uh, or what would you? My, Maimonides less so. Um, uh, Maimonides is primarily someone in the being theology, but for all the reasons that uh, he doesn't need a Christian theology, right? He's uh, mm -hmm. he, he's philosophically inclined to Aristotle, but he's inclined to Judaism even more than to Aristotelian philosophy. And uh, if there's any third element it would be something like mysticism, um, but he's not he's not a Neoplatonist. He would tend to reject Neoplatonism as superstitious. But he would also reject a lot of um, Christian theology as um, somewhat superstitious in the same way, but also as especially derogating from the unity of God. Right? Um, there, uh, Christians are polytheists to Maimonides, if I can put it that way. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm putting it crudely, but the, the, it's the, the yeah. point where he would agree with the uh, Muslims among who is, he is living, that they are both the true monotheists and the, the Christians are people who associate <laughs> other beings less than God with God. So that's where my monotheists would come out of it. Um, Strauss, I don't think, had a religious bone in his body. Um, he's huh. philosophically Platonist, but not Neoplatonist at all. He would never go to Neoplatonism. Okay. Uh, he's way too much of a rationalist to be interested in Neoplatonism. He does understand that tradition as being there, and he will um, relate it to certain things about um, philosophical life as seeking uh, 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 wisdom or enlightenment. Uh, there are versions of that in the Neoplatonic tradition, which are um, uh, understanding the truth as union with the active intellect and all this other kind of stuff. Um, he mentions all those things, but I don't think he believes in any of them. To him, they're, 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 they're metaphors for the philosophic life. Um, so, uh, compared to anyone like Maimonides, he is much more of a, um, uh, philosophical, unbelieving modern, if I can put it that way. And the last thing I was going to ask, cause I know we're almost out of time was that the, the mention about skepticism and the amount of derision he had <coughs> towards the idea of skepticism, and you mentioned it quickly, but could you give me your quick take on what he thinks the fatal blow to skepticism, not just in theology, because I think he's trying to do both. He just thinks it's a bad way of thinking about or a bad philosophical position in general. So he, his, well, why his, is that? His, his, his understanding of skepticism is as a species of philosophical despair, right? Um, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a line, uh, I forget who, who says, uh, uh, confuse, confuse the, uh, uh, the goal of thought with the point at which we become tired of thinking, right? Um, the, uh, uh, to him, skepticism is simply a matter of uh, despair over the possibility of rational knowledge or of a philosophical giving up. And he has a whole history of medieval philosophy, which famously culminates in the, in, in, well, famously culminates. I don't know how famous any of Gilson's claims are, but he, he, he says that, that, um, uh, scholasticism ends in a kind of skeptical morass, especially post William of Ockham, he's thinking, right? Between, mm -hmm. between nominalism and skepticism, uh, you, you have different schools that are still maintaining their uh, armed camp-like positions with regard to each other, but the, the overall outside university philosophy has become, um, is dissolving into skepticism, where everyone thinks they can refute each other's doctrines, but don't think they can establish their own. Um, and plenty of people are perfectly satisfied with that because they think it means that that's all the more reason to uh, not follow philosophy, but to uh, uh, trust to the uh, theological authorities, uh, a, an attitude of skepticism that was already there in people like Ghazali, and that was something that William of Ockham was in a way after. But, uh, and others are taking it in the direction of, um, since we cannot arrive at philosophical truth, every, the only thing that matters in, in philosophy and theology is morals. Right, so you get a kind of Erasmian humanism uh, coming out of skepticism. So people like Erasmus, people like uh, uh, William of Ockham, people like Montaigne, or who he's thinking of as the where uh, where medieval Western medieval philosophy ends up, and it ends up in a skepticism that's earlier than modern skepticism, and then 
uh, Descartes, you know, tries to go through skepticism to something else he can arrive at, but, you know, uh, makes skepticism all that stronger as a result. And then Hume is skepticism <laughs> entire, right? Um, the, the, the famous claim that Gilson makes about modern philosophy post Descartes in his book, uh, Methodological Realism, is that once Descartes uh, severs the uh, the mind from the world outside of it, um, and and wants us to achieve everything that we can achieve by e even after a radical doubt, where we think we only have the interior of our consciousness to work from. Uh, he claims, Gilson claims, uh, you will never make contact with reality again. You will be you will be left in skepticism. Whatever contact with reality no. you could, whatever whatever contact with reality you can make after that point, will remain subject to the same skeptical doubts that Descartes. Uh, supposedly raised against it. So, uh, could I almost done? Right. The, okay. the point is yeah. that that Gilson thinks that both medieval philosophy ended in a skepticism, and modern philosophy since Descartes is ending in a skepticism around his own time. And he thinks that the solution to both is to go back to metaphysics and do it right. Okay. Well, uh, I was this is just a minor thing terminology wise could, could I be safe to use <clears throat> in regard to Descartes separation to say he divided the physical world from the corporeal world that you know now you have a world of physics that only th calculates and then you have the corporeal realm where you know we experience because you said but mind and physical so I wanted to make sure that it would so be, be clear, okay. Be would mind so, so, de, 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 for Descartes, the corporeal is exactly what the corporeal world is not for Descartes. The um, uh, the world of interior sense experience, right? For for Descartes, the corporeal is precisely what you're left with when you take away from all the uh, uh, things that you can sense, the parts of them that seem accidental. And seem to differ from one mind to another. The 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 okay. mathematical, well-behaved, uh, uh, essential nature of the exterior material world is the corporeal world. And what we means by the corporeal world there is something like um, matter reduced to extension in space. Right? It's the it's the math mm -hmm. the mathematical physics version of reality. That's what he means by the corporeal world. He doesn't call the, 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 the world of just sense experience the corporeal world, because he thinks that oh. sense, sense experiences or qualia you know, are often completely illusory, right? He doesn't call that corporeal. Like his example yeah, well, of the wax, you know, the wax is corporeal and it's real, but as extended substance, not as having a certain okay. taste or color or, 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 uh, or, or um, consistency. All of which change as soon as you melt it. Okay, and so then with the other part, the other realm of reality would be the realm so, of abstract math, or, or so. So he he think he thinks that abstract thought and the corporeal world uh, can can be brought into correspondence with one another. He doesn't think that the world of sense perceptions can be thought brought into. Uh, consistency with either one of them, right? There's plenty of illusions. But he think, Descartes thinks of thought and extension as the two modes of substance. So on the one side, you have the extended material thing in its mathematical physics abstract down to bare bones version. That's one thing. And on the other, you have the actual pure thought of the pure math about it. That's the other. So you have a pure rationalism of the pure math and you have the pure extension of the extended thing. And he says that those two things are the two modes of one substance, the thought about the thing and the extended abstract essential nature of the thing. Okay. And, and those two and the correspondence of those two is what he thinks everything truly real is. There are things which are appearances, there are things which subsist, there are things like qualia that aren't real and do depend upon us individual consciousness, right? But the real stuff, the stuff that is independent of any particular mind trying to think it, is the thought-like truth about the extended things. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah, good question. Uh, we're at 501. 
I'm supposed to call a, a sister back to talk about dinner, but uh, I, I want to give room for a last round of questions. Yes, no? I'm, uh, I got my mind is empty. I've, I've been Your listening mind is empty. and listening, okay. and I want, to watch <laughs> it. I want to watch it over again. And uh, maybe I'll get questions in, but otherwise, I'm eager to go forward into two and recommend two weeks. Yes. Uh, we can, I don't know if it'll be two or three, but I'll check. Uh, let me look for a second. Um, I could potentially do two. Uh, two would be the 13th. Would the 13th Makes work? Sense, yes. Yeah. Jim? Yep. OK. Um, uh, all right, I, I have one last thought to leave you with, because I, I, I kind of rushed over it in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the criticisms I was making of how uh, Gilson is um, uh, claiming that Neoplatonism is inconsistent with Christianity, right? So uh, page 37, uh, second paragraph, well, first full paragraph, middle of the paragraph, right? Um, OK. If being coincides with intelligibility, the first intelligibles must also be the first beings, but the divine ideas are the first intelligibles, hence they are the first beings. Now it is sound Neoplatonism that if being is the first creature of God, the ideas are creatures. On the other hand, since the Christian God is being, he is his own ideas, which means that the divine ideas are God. This obviously leads us to assert two utterly irreconcilable positions, namely that the ideas are created and that they are God. How could a Christian thinker maintain that there are creatures in God and that such creatures are God? I just want you to notice this. The two utterly irre irreconcilable opinions are that ideas are created and that ideas are God. And the very start of the next sentence is, how could a Christian thinker maintain this? Do you see the problem? Yep. What's the problem? Well, I can understand why a, why, a, why a Muslim wouldn't agree that something could be created and be God. I can understand why a Jew might believe that something couldn't be created and be, and be God. But this is a person who claims that his whole philosophy is based upon an incarnation, claiming that right. it is utterly irreconcilable that something that could be created and be God. Right, Jesus. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, but to me that to me that was like, um, yeah, I know it's uh, to me it was. I think uh, well, I was in that's another whole area of discussion. It's it to me. It seems like he arrives there because of his concept of how God, from a Christian perspective, how God could manifest His presence. A and B, the the idea that God can't learn anything, I and think that idea is pretty pervasive. You know, I, I think I think it's much simpler than that, right? It's 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 he honestly thinks that nothing created deserves to be called God, right? And he doesn't realize that that makes him a, a at best, an Aryan. <laughs> Just never occurs to him that that's the Aryan position. <laughs> I mean, that's the, the one place where the, the the Jews, the Muslims, and the Aryans could 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 meet and hold a high festival. They entirely agree upon this proposition. <laughs> <laughs> but the very next sentence says, how could a Christian think this? He's like, okay, um, hmm. Maybe you don't know what the word means. <laughs> the, the other one, though, is his, uh, his, his proof that there is uh, no possibility of a, uh, of a uh, being theology in Christianity because there is no, uh, uh, there is no um, uh, uh, idea of the good or of the one in Exodus. I gave you Gregory of Nyssa's take on that. But besides Gregory of Nyssa's take on that, just look at what happens if you universalize this principle. If you just take that same principle, if, if, if a theological proposition is not an exodus, it cannot be Christian, you arrive at the assumption that the incarnation is not an exodus. 
So the incarnation cannot be Christian. <laughs> mm -hmm. So take the lid off. But but both both of the propositions he uses here to prove to try to prove that that uh, that Neoplatonism is not consistent with Christianity. Instead, prove that only Judaism is consistent with Christianity. <laughs> hmm. Is there a possibility he was trying to be? We use rhetoric a little bit like Nietzsche does. I don't Maybe, think so. You know, I honestly don't think so. The moment. Hmm. I honestly don't think so. I think what's going on here is that you know he he he's not paying enough attention to the consequences of his of his claims and the way an opponent could use those consequences, and he is. Uh, relying on the perfect hier hierarchy accepted uh, orthodoxy of his own um, theological positions, right, to protect him from consequences that he does not see, right? He does not see that he is disproving the incarnation with an argument he makes about Exodus because it never occurs to him that anyone would doubt the incarnation. <laughs> He's probably worried about monism. It's worried about monism. That's saying if the creature's identical, he's probably thinking of nature, created things. Uh, he, you know, he, he's 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 trying to he's trying to uh, uh, he's trying to make the he, he's trying to um, immunize Aquinas against the charge of heretical innovation for bringing a Aristotelian uh, metaphysics into a, a previously Platonic tradition. And by and the way he's doing it is he's trying to say the Neoplatonic version was already a foreign. Uh, plot, uh, uh, Plotnian um, non-Christian import, right? And to do that, he has to maintain that it's more non-Christian than it actually is. And all he manages to show is that Neoplatonism is incompatible with Judaism. He has not shown that it's incompatible with Christianity. <laughs> uh, you know, I just wanted to comment that the, uh, I think the only previous time uh, outside of this uh, material we've been calling you, perhaps in Usia, Usia used? Yes. Okay. Oh, is in uh, reading Gibbon, in which he okay. was talking about the Arian controversy and Homo Usia versus something else. Yes. And and that's okay. Are they of one and, substance? Well, I thought the Homo Usians were the uh, ones that were against the Arians. Am I wrong? Uh, yes. They 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 want to say that, uh, that God the Father and God the Son are of one substance, not of two substances. Right. That's the Arian position. No, the Arian position is that is that God the Father is exalted far above uh, the Son. Okay, so homoousia is the uh, classical uh, position that the West now espouses. What and the East. To the... And the East. Okay, yeah, because they killed all the Arians. <laughs> Mostly they converted, but some of them they killed. <laughs> Put them on the rag. The, 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 the people who are still Arians are called Muslims. Makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. That, they're not actually mean, Aryan, they're, but they're they're people. The, the, the people, yeah, the, yeah. Moder the modern monotheists who claim that God is exalted far above Jesus, right, are, are Muslims. They're not Aryans. Well, if you were an Aryan at the time of whenever, uh, and the Muslims came along because they hadn't get come, you would think, oh, maybe these guys are right. <laughs> yes, it, it would. For the same reason that Arianism seemed more plausible to the Germanic tribes of northern Germany than uh, than the Orthodox position did. Uh, uh, Islam would seem more uh, uh, plausible to the same sorts of people than, uh, you know, than all of the uh, refinements of a Neoplatonic uh, 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 metaphysical hierarchy, right? It's it's much simpler to tell them there's only one God and He is the Father, and you know, <laughs> all these other things are just uh, are, are are just uh, teachers and intermediaries and not the actual the one God, right? That's a much easier situ uh, uh, doctrine for anyone to swallow. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, but is that the only thing going on with the Aryans? It's a slight disservice to them to say that's the only thing going on with the Aryans. It's the main thing accounting for how widely the Aryan notions were accepted. The actual theologians mm -hmm. who were trying to propound the Aryan position were, you know, trying to make more subtle distinctions than that. They were too clever by half and so on. But but fundamentally, they had had the same problem that they didn't want to they couldn't they could not comprehend that anything created deserve to truly be called God. And, and, and which side of the debate the was the filioque on? Filioque versus fil, fil is it? Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm not up on all the, on, on all the latest. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember that part given it went on for a whole chapter and I thought to myself, 
oh my god and maybe 200 years and incredible what they were fighting over i was yeah, reading as modern you know i was very uh reinforced in my atheism yes which is a slightly unjust care, uh, outcome that gibbon was directly aiming at but yes that's exactly <laughs> That's exactly what Gibbon wanted, right? You know, uh, he, 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 so yeah. I know. <laughs> um, the, the, the same thing is true, by the way, with the people who uh, dismiss the scholastics as discussing how many angels can dance in the head of the pin and that sort of thing. Um, the, 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 the thing they're actually trying to uh, talk about is uh, whether or not uh, uh, sub substance, the notion of substance implies the notion of matter, right? That's the actual subject they're discussing. Um, and whether or not, uh, if matter is the principle of individuation, uh, there can be more than one of something which doesn't have matter, or there can only be mm -hmm. one of it, right? And that's the thing which gets turned into, a perfectly reasonable philosophical discussion to have, that that's the thing that gets turned into how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Um, anyway, uh, I should, I should uh, run off and call my sister back. Uh, this was fun. I will okay. uh, stop recording and put this up. If you do have more questions, uh, we can... Uh, Try to try to talk about them uh, some other time, but uh, good okay. stuff. And we'll, I'll put up something for the next one in two weeks. It's just the next chapter, obviously. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Take bye. Easy. Yeah. Bye bye.